black. Telestine fighters plunged toward the carrier and sped away as their bombs pierced her hull. It was a terrible thing to see. A beautiful ship. Beautiful to him, in any case. A rough jumble of parts, the effort of blind hope and hundreds of mechanics. Mobbed by fighters, dying by slow inches. Captain Kim didn't have a chance. The Washington was dying. He didn't give an order. He didn't have to. There was no going home to their ship anymore. And if there was one thing he was sure of, it was the raging fury of the rest of his wing. They accelerated so hard he heard a few heads other than his own slam back into the headrests. The rest of the groups swam back into formation in a three-dimensional arrow. The thing he wanted more than anything was to climb out of the cockpit and lash out with his hands. He wanted to drive a blade into one of these bastards and see them bleed. He wanted the impact of his fists and a blade and blood and their screams in his ears, and if all he had was this trigger and the missiles under the wings, it was a poor consolation, but their deaths would do. If he was dying here, he was going to make it hurt for them first. He'd make them bleed. He fired a missile and saw the rest of his team do the same. The missiles were for capital ships, and the Telestine fighters didn't stand a chance. They did not so much explode as vanish, dust rather than shards in the black. Too quick, too easy a death. He looked up, teeth bared in an animal grin. Come on, team. We're taking the carrier. No one even questioned. They arced right and shot up at the belly of the ship. Missiles blazed as the wings shot and banked again. A gaping maw exploded where the missiles connected with the Telestine ship, and it rocked in place, escaping air pushing it into a spin before the engines compensated. He could feel it watching him like a malevolent beast. Anyone know where the CICs are in these things? I think it's time to do a guided missile run. From the dead silence, he knew no one had mistaken his meaning. They didn't have guided missiles. Up top, Chief. I think, anyway. That's the Telestine way. Always on top. Whiskey's voice was professional. I'll come with you. I've got half my missiles. I've got some missiles still, too. Someone chimed in. The rest of the group fell away from the three of them as they streaked toward the top of the ship. Barker looked back once to see them each in their own path. They'd picked targets. They were ready to give everything they had. Lights flickered up on his screen as his team armed their missiles one by one. He flicked the cover on his up and hesitated a moment. His finger trembled when it came down on the button. A moment later, the warning beep showed him that Whiskey and the other pilot had done the same. Hit at three points or join up? Her voice was deferential. The four of the ship grew in their view as he considered his answer. Together, it wasn't going to make much of a difference. Debris shot past them. He turned on his wide channel comm to listen. He could hear Captain Brown of the Pele yelling orders, another wing of fighters calling to one another. Collision course, his screen flashed. He canceled the alert. His hands were shaking. He took them from the yoke. Barker? He looked over. Yeah. Good speech. He managed to smile. Thanks. Honor to fly with you, Whiskey. Same, Chief. He did not watch his death coming. He turned his head to look at New Beginnings Station. A shattered husk of what it had been. Solar panels floating in shards nearby, tumbling to catch the light of the planet. Other Telestine carriers surrounded it, unleashing hell. Hellfire and brimstone, he thought suddenly, the phrase from his youth surfacing unexpectedly. He looked at the place he'd called home, the creaking hunk of metal that had been just enough to keep them alive, and just enough to kill them. And then the Telestine carrier blotted everything else out, and he leaned back in his seat as his fighter slammed into the CIC, two kilotons of explosive energy ripping through the hull. Chapter 14 Earth Mountains near Denver, North American Continent By the third day, they could reliably see the laboratory without binoculars. By the sixth day, it was possible to pick out its shape. Almost round at the base, with elegant structures stacked atop the high-tech approaching wizardry flotation devices. Pike, who had once seen the estates on Venus, described them to the soldiers with him as they walked. He tried to explain, but there were few words to describe the way it felt to descend into that hellish atmosphere. All boiling clouds and jets of superheated air. 
at least at the lower altitudes. And one time he'd accidentally strayed too low, trying to avoid official detection on a smuggling run. The Aggie withstood the pressure, and thank God most of the heat. But there was no way to miss what was happening outside in the boiling Venetian maelstrom. It took no special knowledge to look at that place and know that it was wildly hostile to life, though the denizens of the luxury estates assured Pike that the view was an acquired taste and highly prized. The soldiers seemed to find his descriptions of the Venetian atmosphere more interesting than the estates. Pike supposed he understood that. He'd had a sense of almost visceral revulsion the first time he stepped foot on the polished floors of one of the opulent floating mansions, everything clean, gleaming, and the rest of humanity practically imprisoned. Tell Steen pets those Venetians, one of the soldiers muttered. If they'd helped us, maybe we could take down these ships rather than trying to get up to them. It was hard to argue with that. The tech for those estates was Telestine through and through, and only the richest of humanity had been able to settle on Venus. The tycoons, the upper echelons of the UN, hell, even the Pope, supplied by the cargo guild and waited on by servants, the rich on Venus seemed a universe away from the rest of humanity. Walker had mentioned that some of them served in the rebellion, but Pike wondered if that was only wishful thinking. This whole mission was wishful thinking. Pike edged his way along a narrow ledge toward the resting spot their guides had chosen. His breath was coming short. Between acclamation and growing exhaustion, it was difficult to tell if his situation was getting better or worse. Even the fact that he was keeping up seemed like a mixed blessing. He didn't understand why he was here, lugging a rocket-propelled grenade launcher on his back. He'd been working his way to a good life of honest commerce, and mostly honest smuggling on the Aggie with his fellow crewmates, and he'd thrown it all away for this. Mountains and trees. Remember, Pike, mountains and trees. Rest up, Eva handed him a mostly empty water skin. When he looked at her with a wordless expression, she jerked her head toward the laboratory. We're almost to the shuttles. It would be a while longer until they actually entered its shadow, but the floating lab already seemed to draw all of the light to it. It sat heavy in the air above the next peak. Then Eva's eyes fixed on something out on the plains, and he turned to look. Holsteins. When the Telestines first arrived and the human solar diaspora started, Pike's father said, they set all the food animals loose. They wanted herds out roaming the land like nature intended. Only they hadn't quite realized that the animals they found in the warehouses weren't the same as the animals that had freely roamed. So for a few years, all they got to watch were majestic herds of chickens wander back and forth. Whenever he told those stories, Pike's father had laughed until he cried gesturing with his elbows and neck in a wild imitation of a chicken strut. The chickens had mostly died off over time, but some of the cows and pigs survived. Many of those were surreptitiously tended to by humans now. Ava's voice called him back to the present. We're close enough now that we're probably going to trigger their defensive system soon, she grimaced. We made better time than I expected. I thought we'd be able to get the fighters and get up there from outside its defensive range. Pike only nodded. He went to return the water skin to her, but drew his hand back as he caught sight of Charlie, standing alone at the edge of the camp. The men had been silent on the climb, and Pike had rarely seen him either sleep or eat. He carried the water skin over now and held it out. Charlie hesitated before accepting. He had spoken little to Pike since their first meeting near the camp, when Pike had guessed at the other man's true motivations for participating in the raid. But in the end... He couldn't blame the man. Family first. Blood first. Thanks. He drained the last of the water and held the empty skin back out. There's a creek ahead. We'll be able to refill it air. Pike nodded. His eyes followed Charlie's to the laboratory. He had not wanted to ask, but he supposed he should know what he was in for before they got to the ship. You think they're up there? Charlie looked at him wordlessly. Your family, Pike clarified. I know what you meant. Charlie's gaze clicked over Pike's face, calculating. Why? You never told me about them. Wasn't much point, was there? You think they're dead. The man's mouth twisted. You're not going to get me to give up on them, though. I know. Pike set the RPG launcher down at last. So? You think they're there? To be honest, 
I don't know what I think. Charlie's voice held an ache. I don't know where they were taken. I don't even know who took them. We were hunting one day, and when we came back, they were all gone. We? Charlie looked back at the group of soldiers and pointed to his chest, then to two others. Me, Hank, Eva, we all joined up after that. We'd said we wouldn't bring any harm to our families by taking risks, but once we didn't have our families anymore, he caught sight of the look on Pike's face. What? Nothing. Pike crossed his arms. He felt the other man's gaze linger on his face. My father didn't take your precautions. Brought the Telestines down on us. Charlie was silent for a moment. I didn't take risks, he said finally. Didn't bring the Telestines down on us, but it didn't matter in the end. Sometimes fate frowns equally on the wise and the stupid. Pike turned back to the camp. He refused to listen to this again. Might as well be his father standing there, reminding him that humanity was dying. Pike hadn't listened to the man's entreaties then, and he wouldn't listen now. Charlie's voice stopped him in his tracks, though. Diana was three days old when they got taken. Pike looked over his shoulder. Charlie was staring at him. Three days, and Tar couldn't even walk yet. It was a hard delivery, but we thought they were going to pull through. I left her at the camp with Samantha, Hank's wife. Hank was a doctor, a real one. We thought they were safe. We were too far away when we saw the ships leaving. We thought they'd just been shot, and in the end we went back to bury them. Wondered what we had to lose now that they were dead. And their bodies weren't even there. They'd just been taken. When I joined the rebellion, that, that's when I found out about the labs. They might have been taken for the disassembly. It takes a baby for that. And Hank's wife was pregnant, too. Pike rubbed at his head. I'm sorry, but do you have a kid? Charlie challenged him. Do you have a wife waiting for you in the rebellion? No. There was only one woman he'd ever thought he might be able to love. And her only love was the rebellion. It was just as well, really. I'm doing right by my family, Charlie said fiercely. That's all. That's all this is. Look down on it if you want, but I'm trying to get them free. If you can't understand someone doing that, why are you here? I wanted to come home. Mountains and trees. But that was an insult to the rest of them here. He couldn't say it. Pike met Charlie Boyd's eyes, and for the first time since he left Earth, he began to wonder if something had been missing from his life all these years. He wondered, finally, what would have happened if the Telestines had never come for them all those years ago? Would he have ended up joining the rebellion? Would he be fighting for a daughter and a wife taken to the labs? He didn't have time to wonder for long. The ground next to him exploded, and the hiss crack of the Telestine guns reached them a second and a half later. Blown sideways and nearly off his feet, the side of his face blistering, Pike grabbed the RPG launcher and ran for the outcropping of rock nearby. The rebellion soldiers were yelling to one another, but he didn't hear screams. Hopefully that meant no one was injured, not that people were dead. A hand reached out and grabbed at his through the flying dust and rock, and Charlie hauled him to safety. He was bleeding, but there was an incongruous grin on the man's dirty face. It's finally starting! He hauled the launcher out of Pike's hands and began loading it. Thank God! God, I hate the waiting. For the first time since he'd been back, Pike laughed. He actually laughed. His hands fumbled with the launcher. Me too. Let's get up there and finish it. Chapter 15 Earth Mountains near Denver, North American Continent The bullets were coming fast enough now that the echoing reports overlapped. The sound was deafening. The ground nearby tossed up burning chips of rock, and he couldn't even spare the time to hope he'd still have hair on his arms by the end of this. It's loaded! Charlie yelled over the noise. Brace me! He took aim, Pike's hands on his shoulders, and the RPG hurtled away with a jolt that sent them both stumbling backward. Another hollow boom sounded behind them, and Pike ducked instinctively as a grenade shot overhead. His head whipped around to follow it, and his mouth dropped open as it spun toward a Telestine fighter. Closer, closer, and the ship swerved at the last second. It didn't swerve quite enough. 
The grenade caught it on one wing and sent it spinning down into the foothills, black smoke trailing behind it. There was a ragged cheer behind him, but a distracted one. The soldiers were already loading the grenade launcher again. They fired and fired, over and over, until Pike was fairly certain he was never going to be able to hear anything ever again, and he was keeping himself going almost entirely with the thought that every grenade he shot at the Telestines was a grenade he didn't have to carry for another day's worth of hiking. Keep going, he heard dimly. They're launching more feathers. Our ships won't be here for a few minutes. Keep going. Did she say feathers? Pike yelled. Charlie shot again before answering and grimaced. The launcher was ensuring he would have bruises tomorrow. He turned his head back to nod as they loaded the launcher again. Yeah, like the ones that shot you down. Feathers because of the pattern on the outside. The other ones, the black ones, don't look like that. Other ones? Yeah, they have different kinds. Maybe they do different things, I don't know. He shot again and took the last grenade from Pike. All right, brace and- One of the fighters buzzed low over them out of nowhere and Charlie's shot went wild. He tumbled, taking Pike down with him, and both of them looked up to watch the grenade streak away into the sky. A fighter, Feather, Pike reminded himself, had just dropped from the belly of the floating lab and was still apparently finding its bearings. It swerved desperately to get away from the grenade. It swerved up, and every one of the humans on the ground winced as the feather sliced directly into the hull of the lab. A few moments later, the sound of tearing metal reached their ears. Holy shit, Charlie muttered. I wonder if it's... He didn't get any further than that. With an agonized groan, the airship tilted. It hung askew, and the sounds of desperate clanking carried on the wind. The bullets ceased. Silence. Pike looked around himself, certain for a moment that he had finally gone deaf, but there were no explosions. Nothing remained but the now silent airship and the smoke beginning to trail from the open gash in the underside of the hull. Run! Eva was behind him, her hand on his arm. Run! What? Leave the launcher, run! She took off down the hill. The shuttles, go! It took a moment for him to make out a path, and he still wasn't entirely sure he wanted to follow her. Why are we still going up there? Because it's going to crash? She tossed a look over her shoulder. I know, that's why I'm asking. The dawning is still on there, and... Just come on! She hurtled a bush and stumbled a bit on the landing before hauling herself up with a wince. Now! Right. And the humans, of course. The ones being experimented on. Wanting to leave was a cowardly impulse at best, but he couldn't shake the thought that none of them wanted to see what was up there. None of them were going to be able to forget it. Wait. Eva skidded to a halt. The others streamed past them and she turned to watch them distracted. Her hand was on his arm, her eyes distant. What if- What? He saw the others hauling tarps off two small shuttles. What is it? The dawning. If it's a key to all of the defense network, what if that means it keeps the network up? Her face twisted. What if we let that thing crash? He looked up at it. Was it dropping in altitude? It was. We can't take that chance, he said finally. We have to go. If it can take down the networks, we can't take the chance that destroying it will do that. Her hands clenched. What? He pressed her. I don't want to lose my team for a mission we can't complete. We're not dying for nothing. She was picking a hell of a time to bring that up. He shook his head. No time for that. We have to move. Come on. He saw her waver and lifted his shoulders. At least three of your team think their family might be up there. There's no way you're not losing at least them and a shuttle. Damn it. She blew out her breath. You're right. Come on. Just between us, though. She gave him a sideways look as she jogged down the hill. I kind of thought you'd take my opportunity to be out of here, to go make your cabin in the mountains and have your life on Earth like you always wanted. Yeah, so did I. He'd never been good at lying, even when he really should. Why didn't you just head out then? He thought about it, silent as they tried to move as quickly as possible without slipping on the shale. But he didn't have an answer. He shook his head. I, I don't know. You'd better figure it out, she advised him. Why do you care? I care, she said grimly. Because a lot of people join up, 
and then there are bullets coming at them, and they don't think it's a good bet anymore, and they leave other people in the lurch. Maybe it's the first battle, maybe it's the fourth, but they go, and we're always the ones who die for it. And you may be the one the Almighty Rebellion sent to help us out, but I'm not risking my team for you, and I'm not risking my home for you. We're the ones who have to live with the consequences, you got that? Yeah, he was oddly comforted. And thanks for not making it about honor and duty, huh? Not exactly a different speech, but sure. Her shoulders shrugged, and she held out a hand to haul him into one of the shuttles, hidden by brush under an outcropping of rock. There, that's your seat. Strap yourself in and put in your earpiece. We'll need a way to communicate while we're up there. Right. He settled into the seat with a jerk as the shuttle took off and plugged the earpiece in. He turned it on with a button press. And a moment later, a man's voice crackled in his ear. Hello, Mr. Pike. Hello? Who's this? He assumed it was one of the other fighters in another shuttle about to give him instructions. But the buzz, the background noise of the transmission was off. That's not important right now. You're the only one that can hear me, so listen carefully. The voice paused as if waiting for him to speak. Mr. Pike, I'm going to help you find the dawning. Without my help, you surely will not find it, and in return, I hope you will consider bringing it directly to me once you have it. Chapter 16 Earth Mountains near Denver, North American Continent who are you? Pike repeated. His voice was trembling with anger. Pike? Eva frowned over at him. Are you getting interference? Mr. Pike, I have my reasons when I suggest that you don't tell her what you're hearing. Pike hesitated. He didn't have to do what the voice said, he reminded himself. It was human, it knew about the dawning, and it was offering to help. He'd cut off the call when he had what he needed. Until then... He'd work at finding out just why this person wanted him to betray Walker. He nodded at Eva. Some interference, but it's fine. The voice paused. He could almost imagine its owner smiling. Could he sense what Pike was thinking? Thank you. Judging by what I know of you, you're going to want answers as to why I'm doing this, and why I'm requesting what I am. Unfortunately, I can't give them to you just yet. Judging by what the voice knew of him, that meant he had to be somewhere in the rebellion, didn't it? Only Rachenkov and the rebellion knew he was here, and Rachenkov would never tell. They might disapprove of Pike's current activities, but the man was as loyal as they came. Mr. Pike! That sounds like your problem, Pike said simply. He pitched his voice low. Last time I checked, you were the one who needed me. And we're operating over a line that could be tapped at any time. The voice seemed neither surprised nor perturbed by Pike's sentiments. I can offer you two assurances. First, that you will come to no harm if you bring the dawning to me, and second, that I have humanity's best interests at heart. Pike considered this, and the shuttle gave an unpleasant sideways lurch. I can't get the doors open! The pilot twisted to look at Eva. They're not responding to the codes! Tell him to try reversing the code and re-entering it. Pike closed his eyes for a moment. He had the feeling that this was only going to lead further down the rabbit hole. Try reversing the code, he called up front. Uh, sure, one second. The pilot punched in the numbers, and a screech of metal rewarded them. That worked, how'd you know to do that? Recent rebellion intelligence. He hated this. Recent rebellion intelligence. The words were grudging, and he dropped his voice again. It didn't take much not to be heard. What with the shuttle bay doors opening so loudly nearby? It's not really rebellion intelligence, is it? I think you know the answer to that. Now, Mr. Pike, do we have a deal? Maybe. I see. But may I ask, why exactly are you here? Pike fell silent. His spine had stiffened. You aren't a member of the rebellion, the voice told him. You have no known political sympathies, beyond an old friendship with the Admiral. And with the state of humanity at present, I'm sure we all have an old friendship with a revolutionary. So, why are you here? On one of the most dangerous missions the rebellion has ever launched. I didn't say no quick enough, and fell bass backwards into it. He really wasn't good at lying. 
There was a sharp, brief laugh on the other end of the line. An acceptable answer, Mr. Pike. If we're going to keep doing this, could you call me Pike? Very well. The man sounded amused. By the way, you'll want to turn right out of the landing bay, not left, and then up the first two flights of stairs you find. It may be on that level. If not, I have some further guesses. I'll be in touch. The line switched off. Pike weighed his options. Somehow the play-by-play -play offered by the voice was oddly reassuring. When diving into a pit of certain death, it seemed like a good idea to have someone who appeared to know what was going on. Even complete strangers. Are you talking to someone? Eva leaned forward to call the words across the shuttle, and even then he had to strain to hear her over the screech of the doors. He decided not to answer. Where are we going when we get out of the shuttle? He called back. The rebellion map shows labs to the left. I thought we'd start there. What's to the right? We don't know. We only got a partial map. Maybe we should start there. On the other hand, maybe he should have a good follow-up before he started talking. If they don't have maps there, it's probably the important stuff. To his relief, she bought his ad-libbed reasoning. Sounds good. He had a bad feeling about this. For one thing, he was pretty sure he could hear the faint sound of someone chuckling in the earpiece. The shuttle landed with a thump and they piled out into a landing bay that tilted farther than Pike was comfortable with. Shit. Come on, let's move! He had no idea when he'd become a mission leader, but people seemed to fall in behind him without complaint. They followed him into the corridor outside the shuttle bay, and he didn't even pause when he saw Charlie split off to the left with Hank and a few of the others. Eva watched them go, but she nodded when she saw the look on Pike's face. There's no saving them, her eyes said. Right. Let's go. They steadied themselves on the wall and took the stairs at a gingerly pace. It was harder than it looked to climb a slanted staircase. Pike kept his rifle up as he climbed, ready for Telestines to appear in his sights. But there were no running footsteps ahead, no alarms. Nothing to indicate that the Telestines on the ship either knew about the intruders or sensed anything amiss. I don't like this, Eva murmured, and he couldn't help but agree. He stopped dead when he emerged from the stairwell. Eva ran into the back of him and pushed her way past, only to stop with a muttered oath. It was an eerily empty room, wide open, with only a featureless white cube in the center of it. The ceiling stretched high above, and the skewed angle of the floor only made the whole thing look stranger. The walls and floor were the same gunmetal gray, and a flight of stairs led up to the floor above. Is that it? Eva edged toward it. The cube was easily four feet to a side. How are we going to carry it? How do we use it? I don't know. That's not it. That's a communications array. Keep going, up the stairs. Pike only narrowly kept himself from asking how. Exactly, the voice knew the difference. He was saved from offering that knowledge himself, however, by one of the other soldiers. That's just a comm box. He was in one of the labs at one point, Eva murmured in an undertone. She looked over at the soldier. Is it going to hurt us? Nah, but you can sometimes get him to do stuff, like this. Watch. He picked his way across the floor and slammed the butt of his gun into the cube. With a hiss, eight doors opened around the walls of the room. Pike jumped and swore, and Eva looked around as the floor tilted another few degrees. All right, split up. Everyone remember your path back and give a call if you find anything. I'll go up the stairs. Pike didn't wait for an answer, but just took off at a run. He slowed as he negotiated the difficult incline on the stairs. There were still no Telestines, and that was beginning to bother him. When he reached the top of the staircase, the hallway split in three directions. All right, what now? There was a pause. Go straight. And of the hall, break the door down, and... It's worth saying that I'm not 100% sure what's in there. That's... not reassuring. Pike crept down the hallway with his borrowed rifle up. He hadn't been able to practice on it much, and he was beginning to wish he'd brought his own gun. He was going to kill Reshenkov if the man had touched his baby. If he got back. He reached the door. Pike took a deep breath, steeled himself and punched his foot into it with a roar. He saw a single chair by a large window. A lone figure looked around at the sound. The figure was not a Telestine. 
She was young, at a guess somewhere between sixteen and twenty, with pale brown hair and lips as bleached as her skin. From the beige clothing she wore to the pale sweep of her eyelashes, nothing about her seemed to have any color at all. Except the eyes. The eyes were jet black and older than death. Pike stopped. There's a girl. And? And that's it. It can't be. The voice sounded genuinely bewildered. I can't be reading this wrong. It's supposed to be in there. Shit. Pike looked around himself. The room was manifestly empty, and the girl was still staring at him with those eyes. Outside, human fighters shot past the window, some pursuing silvery feathers, others pursued by them. Flaming debris hit the window and he jumped. The girl didn't. Then the station shrieked and tipped, and Pike made what he swore later seemed like a good decision at the time. The station was crashing, and the dawning was nowhere to be seen. He could go down with the labs, or he could get out and make a plan B. Just make the best decision, Walker's voice said. Out of time. His voice was curt as he pressed on the earpiece. All teams evacuate, do you read? All teams get out. The lab is going down. He held his hand out to the girl. We have to go. The ship is crashing. Come with me. Chapter 17 Earth Mountains near Denver, North American Continent We have to go. Pike spread his fingers. You're going to die if you stay here. They had room for more in the shuttles. Charlie had made sure of that. Whoever she was, an experiment, a captive, a stolen child, she remained where she was. Those black eyes watched him, and she did not so much as flinch when the ship shuddered again. She didn't trust him, Pike realized. And why would she? If she was here, the rebellion had already failed her. When had he started thinking like that? He lowered the gun and braced himself against the door. His mind protested in panic that he didn't have time for this. Their pilots were dying out there, and if the teams were evacuating, who knew if they'd wait for him? He should go, and she could follow, if she had any sense. But he didn't want to leave her here alone. What if she had been with the Telestines her whole life? What if she still expected them to help her? I'm Bill Pike, he said, gesturing to himself. A thought occurred to him. I'm here to look for the dawning. She cocked her head and her eyes sharpened. I'm human, Pike said earnestly. In a less lethal situation, he might have pounded his chest and said, Me, Tarzan, you, Jane, he continued. And so are you. The smile was sudden and almost impish. Her lips curved and he flushed in embarrassment. So she did know he was human, and she apparently knew English. He shrugged. Just checking. She said nothing, but the smile stayed. Do you know where the dawning is? Pike asked her. They didn't have much time. Pike! Pike! The voice was sudden and sharp. Static was claiming it now, and Pike yanked his hand away from the door frame with a hiss as he heard the crackling of electricity coming from some unknown source. Pike! Static claimed the man's voice. Her and get- Are you there? He turned, pressing his fingers into the earpiece. The hallway behind him was still empty, and despite the chaos outside, nothing stirred behind him in the station. He could not even hear the voices of the others. I can't hear you! Static was his only answer. Static and distorted syllables. Out of there! Well, that fit with his plan. No more time. Pike beckoned her. Are there people in these other rooms? She shook her head. Come on, then. Stay behind me. He went down the hallway as quickly as he could, rifle up. He checked twice and found her close behind him. She didn't seem particularly worried. When a ceiling panel cracked and dropped, she batted it away from herself without even looking. He stopped when he saw that, and she watched him silently. Eventually, she raised her eyebrows, as if to note that he was the one saying they should go. That was a fair observation, he supposed. He crept down the stairs with his weapon up and looked around at the room. For a moment, nothing seemed wrong until the doors had closed. Shit! He ran for the cube and slammed his rifle into it. He was looking around desperately. The doors weren't opening. He slammed the rifle down again, again. Which side had the other soldier used? 
Fingers closed around his sides and firmly ushered him out of the way. The girl crouched down and stared at the featureless white cube. She craned her head to look at each part of it in front of her, searching for something. Her hands came up, palms flat on the white material. Pike swallowed hard. He hadn't noticed in the cage room where she'd been kept, but a thin web of ugly scars traced over the backs of her hands and disappeared up into the sleeves of her beige shirt. Static burst into his earpiece again, but this time he could not make out a single word. He winced as the voice repeated whatever it had been saying, and gave an anguished look at the featureless walls around them. The doors had disappeared entirely. He fumbled at the earpiece to find a volume dial, but it was smooth. Had this been the Telestine plan? Lure attackers in and trap them in the building? He strained for the sound of screams or a cry for help, and heard nothing at all. Had there been traps waiting over the doors, or worse? Did the rest of the soldiers not realize yet that they were trapped? Would they only realize when they tried to return to the shuttles? A hand wrapped around his and tugged. The girl was apparently done looking at the cube. My friends are in there, Pike said, pointing at the walls. She shook her head. Are they dead? She hesitated, then tugged on his hand again and looked toward the shuttle bay. We should go? She gave him a look, jerked her head at the tilted floor. Right, come on, he paused. You wouldn't know where the Telestines are, would you? The hollow boom of an explosion sounded outside, and she gestured toward it. They're all out there? They're scientists fly fighter jets, really? She shrugged. Static roared in his earpiece again, making him wince. This time it didn't stop. Useless. He ripped it out and took off for the shuttle bay. Quick steps behind told him that the girl was following. He swallowed hard when he saw the bay. Smoke was beginning to drift across the floor, and flames were licking at one wall. Both shuttles were still there. Uh, I should get the rest of my team, he told her. It was a useless sentiment. He had no idea where they'd gone, and he'd barely seen the tiniest piece of two floors. The station must have ten at least. Her eyes met his, and there was no judgment there. She looked sad. They got me here, Pike told her. They, he swore silently and stared down at the floor, indulging in a quick moment of regret. Eva had been right. The rebellion had sent him, and he had failed, and her crew was going to die for it. A hiss of machinery caught his ears, and he picked his face up in time to see the girl climbing into the shuttle. As if to validate her decision, the whole station dropped several feet, taking his stomach with it. Instinct got him into the shuttle, and he found her at the co-pilot's chair, hands pressed on the control panel, brow furrowed. She looked up at him in mute appeal. Don't worry, I got this. Roshenkov was going to make himself sick laughing when Pike told him that he'd flown a shuttle. Pike could hear him now. You! How are you still alive? Well, he supposed he might still kill them. He took one last look out the windshield of the shuttle and brought up the screens. The code was still there, and he entered it again. Behind them, the doors slid open. He waited, foolishly, hands on the controls, and the girl watched his hands. At last, seeing his hesitation, she reached out and placed her hand over his, dragging back firmly. The shuttle skidded awkwardly across the floor toward the empty sky, and Pike nodded. Time to go. He looked down at the controls and backed them away, out into the battle. Better to take his chances there than be on the lowest floor of a crashing ship. He was about to get his apprenticeship in flying. Chapter 18 Venus, 49 kilometers above surface, Tong Estate, New Zurich Pike! Pike! Neon tore out the earpiece and threw it. Damn it! What's going on? The Admiral's voice crackled over another line. I can't get the feeds from any of them. Do you know what's happening down there? Her voice was breaking, and he closed his eyes. There's a shuttle leaving. Protect it at all costs. He opened his eyes and tracked her position. Good. Nearly to Earth after a week of burning halfway across the solar system from Jupiter. But after the disaster at New Beginning Station, he wondered where she'd set up headquarters next. It was clear the Rebellion was going to be needing more help in the very near future. Help only he could provide. 
The team got out. Relief was obvious in her voice. He hesitated. Just your mission specialist. There was a long pause, and he could see her looking at the names and pictures of the soldiers who had gone on the mission. The ones who wouldn't come back. Quietly, she asked the one thing that mattered. Did he find it? He stared out the window at the billowing golden clouds, not wanting to say anything at all. No, but he found us someone who might be able to find it, or possibly recreate it, protect the shuttle. Neon swallowed. If we let them shoot it out of the sky, we are all lost. We need to get to them as soon as possible. A pause. Acknowledged. Given the Telestine response during Pike's insertion, this is going to be one hell of a fight. A fight I was hoping to have with the Telestine defense grid down because of the dawning not still fully functioning. A good point. It was decided then. He'd have to reveal part of his hand to Walker and the Telestines. I'll take care of it. I can temporarily disable one of their satellites. The one in geosynchronous orbit roughly over Denver. You'll have a few minutes to get your fighters down there to protect Pike's ascent, but only a few minutes. Another pause. But won't that tip your hand to the Telestines? Clue them in to how much you've infiltrated their systems. She was good. Perceptive. He supposed it was why she was the leader of the rebellion and no longer sharing the position with that buffoon General Essa. It will. But for the dawning, it's a risk we'll have to take. He had to find a way to get in touch with Pike. The man had no idea what he'd found. Neon's hands were white-knuckled on the arms of his chair. Now that he knew there had been a human in the same room as the dawning, he could track her through the data. And no matter how many times he looked, those data kept saying the same thing. This girl always came with the dawning when it moved. She was its caretaker, bound to it in some way. And if she was loyal to the Telestines, there was no telling what she might do next. Chapter 19 Earth, Low Orbit, Bridge, EFS, Intrepid Protect the shuttle! All fighters, protect the shuttle! Walker kept her voice steady through sheer force of will. Her eyes were fixed on the array that hovered over the desk, the bulk of the Telestine station tilting crazily, and the fighters buzzing between it and the sharp spine of the mountains. And hurry it up. We only have a few minutes before we have to get out of here. She already knew they weren't going to make it. The window was closing on the dead space in the Telestine array, courtesy of Neon, and there was no way the fighters could make it out of the gravity well in time to get back to the Intrepid. They would have to go to ground with the rebellion cells and wait until the ship came around again. If the entire Telestine fleet mobilized, this party was going to be over in a hurry, and the horrific loss of New Beginning Station, the Washington, the Pele, Captain Brown, and Captain Kim. The cost they'd already paid was too high for them to fail now. She signaled for the pilot to begin spinning up the engines. We're on it, ma'am. McAllister's voice was steady through the comm link. We're signaling the shuttle, but he's not reading us. Oh, no. She cast a look at the earpiece and her eyes closed in pain for a moment. Pike, I'm coming for you. Hold on. Just do what you can to keep them off him. All right, Che, I'm drawing them off. Fighter 7 peeled off from the group and shot through an approaching formation of feathers. They swerved away from him and regrouped, and he guided his ship up in an arc to shoot directly at the station. I see how you like this, foggers. His voice was a low mutter. Everyone else get them while they're distracted. Fish eye? The call came from the cag. Back in formation. With all due respect, Shay, it's got to be one of us. There was a pause. Then it'll be me, the keg said simply. Break off, fisheye. Oh, no, King whispered. Her voice had gone gray and her hand covered her mouth. No, no. Walker shot her a look and shook her head. There could be no weakness from any of them now. The pilots could not hear any doubt, nor they could hear grief. Nothing was important right now beyond the shuttle. Pike had found, well, something. She had spent her life trying not to be blinded by hope, but right now, Walker could not keep it from welling up in her chest. She bit her lip, felt the skin break, and bit down harder until she was sure she could speak steadily. Give us the view from Fire 7. 
The video feed was sudden and disorienting. The pilot, Dave Fisheye Hernandez, the screen read, had gone into a spin as he arrowed up toward the formation of Telestines. He was refusing to break off the attack, Walker saw now. Fisheye! Gonna get my shot, NLT, and you have a life to build after this. I'm free as a bird, Shay. After this, it would be back to Pluto. And that ain't no life, Pluto. Across the table, King's eyes were bright with tears. Her eyes were fixed on the holograph of the other fighters, not the video feed from Fisheye. There was no time to wonder about that now. Walker turned her gaze to the video. Bullets streaked away from Fisheye, and one Telestine was blown sideways into another. Yes. Delaney's voice was soft, his fist pounded against the desk. Come on, King whispered. Her lips pressed together, holding back a softer entreaty. Her head was half turned. She wanted to look away from this. Come on. The video feed jerked sideways and righted itself, but the ground was curving up slowly into the view. Shit. Fisheye's voice was frantic and then furious. Like hell, I'm not taking a few more of you with me. The video swerved to point straight down at the ground, and the ship gathered speed before the pilot must have yanked the yoke up, relying on aerodynamics and lift to right the fighter. With newfound speed, the ship arced up into the sky, and the single working engine spun the ship to point up at the formation streaking by above. The dying fighter let loose a stream of bullets and a missile, and then it was falling away. Falling. Falling. Cut the— But Walker's command was too late. The feed burst into static, and the whole bridge crew flinched. She had to distract them. She cast about for something. Give me numbers. How many of ours are left, and how many of theirs? Five of ours left, ma'am. Plus the shuttle. Larson met her eyes. McAllister, Tox, Princess, Morrison, Vu, and eight of theirs. His face was white with shock. Two weeks ago they had never lost a fighter in open combat. Now they had lost. Too many and the officers had seen them die. It would be worth it, Walker told herself. She seemed to be reminding herself of that a lot these days. The cog is moving to the fore, Larson reported. He has three on him. The other five? Random. They don't seem to know who to shoot at. Tell our fighters to keep one guarding Pike, and the rest should get those three before— She broke off, before our distraction gets shot down. King's hands were white-knuckled around the edge of the table. Yes, Mum, Larson was murmuring into the earpiece. They're on it. The specks of green, all but one, swung around to face the formation of three red dots. They couldn't see bullets on the hologram, but it was clear a few moments later that all of them were shooting. The Telestine formation spread, and one blipped out of existence a moment later. The cag jerked his ship hard to port in an arc that must have had his muscles screaming. A nod from Walker put his feet up on the screens. They could hear him swearing under his breath as he climbed toward the structure. Two more done, Larson's words died. On the hologram, the Telestine ship tilted further to the side, flickered, and plummeted straight for the mountains below. Holy shit, Delaney murmured. His eyes were wide. It's going to... It disappeared in a mad flicker against the mountain range, and Larson's fingers stabbed at his screen to bring up a video feed from one of the pilots. The CAG's ship shot over the wreck that smoked against the mountainside. It was collapsing in on itself as they watched. Flames shot out of the tangled wreckage of the sides. We should call the fighters back, King's voice was expressionless now. Did the rest of the team get out of the lab? Not that I know of, Walker met her eyes. It's possible, though. Pike's communications were knocked out. Maybe theirs were too, if... A light flared on her screen and the bottom dropped out of her stomach. No. The shuttle's been hit, Mum. Larson looked up at her. She could only shake her head desperately. This couldn't be happening. To have the dawning, and then to lose it. And Pike with it. A voice crackled to life, the cag. The shuttle has fallen, but not destroyed. Fighters to me, get those feathers out of the sky. Just like in training, boys. Walker's fingers were splayed over her stomach. Horror was making it difficult for her to breathe. Pike. The future of the rebellion was plummeting toward the ground below, and all she could think of was Pike. Pike, who would never be down there if it wasn't for her. Delaney's eyes held a warning for her, reminding her to show no weakness in front of the crew, and she drew herself up slowly. 
Her fingers found the desk, and she forced herself to stand straight. No weakness. McAllister, get out of there. King took a sharp breath. Ma'am? He's falling. The best we can do is leave it alone, otherwise they know we're still invested. Get out of there, the window's closing. And we can't afford to lose any more of you. Yes, ma'am. Three feathers swam into view. Shots streaked away, and one exploded in a cloud of silvery debris. All fighters pull up. McAllister's voice was steady. We're going back to the nest. A light blinked out. Sarah Morrison, the holograph read. Age 22, Johnson Station. Walker swallowed. Everyone, keep going! The CAG's voice was desperate. I'm dropping back, I'll cover you. Walker watched as the other ships overtook him, and the whole formation put on speed. He'd turned his guns. Two Telestine fighters blinked out behind him. One left, and the CAG's view screen turned as he guided his ship in another whip-fast turn. They heard the dull thud of his head hitting the side of the windshield. No, King whispered. She looked at Walker. Tell him not to do this. Her voice was pleading. He has to go with the rest. Walker said nothing. Her eyes fixed on the Telestine ship, and she steeled herself for an impact she would never feel. Its guns were swiveling as it swerved, suddenly facing its opponent. It had seen McAllister's ship, and she could only hope it had realized what was happening too late. Missiles burst across the screen, lighting it to a brilliant white, and the feather tumbled out of the sky, smoke trailing from its wings. There was a cheer from the bridge crew. Ma'am, the cag was breathing hard. It's done. Come on home, McAllister. We don't have the time, Delaney hissed. There's Telestine cruisers on the way. I'm not leaving him down there. Coming as fast as I can, ma'am, the voice fuzzed out in return. Just so you know, I gotta look. The shuttle crash landed. They were still maneuvering. It looks like the hull is still intact. There's a chance, the voice cut out. Everyone on the bridge turned to look at Walker, and she, in turn, looked to the holograph. He's still climbing. We have to go, Delaney said again. He's still climbing. She bit the words off. Approaching Atmobrig. Larson's voice was quiet. He didn't want to intervene in this fight. Vent bay four and open it. Close bay two as soon as the other fighters are in. Delaney's hands were clenched. Closer, McAllister climbed, and closer. Mom, there's a satellite coming into range. Probably has some offensive capabilities. Delaney shot her a look and Walker ignored him. Come on. She bit her lips to keep them from moving. Come on, McAllister. The light disappeared on the screen and King's shoulders hunched. He's aboard, Mom. Get us out of here. Her voice was crisp. Now. Chapter 20 Earth Mountains near Denver, North American continent. Later, he would remember nothing from that day. The crash took the memory of the Telestine ship, of Charlie disappearing into the labs. It even took the choice that had led him to take the shuttle and go with his one fugitive. But that day, he remembered all of it, and it played in a sickening loop in his unconscious brain, abandoning the ship, the girl dragging his hand on the controls to launch the shuttle, and the chaos of the battle. He remembered the first strike, and the shuttle tumbling before the guidance systems righted it, and his desperate attempts to guide it down to the ground as the battle raged overhead. Debris fell nearby every few seconds as ships blew apart. He tried not to look. At one point, he'd seen the charred body of a pilot. It had all gone wrong. The dawning was lost to them, and then the ground was rushing up quicker and quicker, and he only had time to look over at the girl sitting next to him and say, I'm sorry. Then there was a burst of pain, a terrible brightness, and then the world went black, and the whole sequence started again as his brain tried to find some way out of what he had done. Stay on the Telestine ship? No, it had crashed as well. The team was dead. Don't go to the ship. He should never have gone to the Telestine ship. He should have never responded to Walker's desperate request. The first thing that let him know he was awake was the frantic beating in his ears and feeling the pressure of his body slumped forward against the restraints. The acrid smell of smoke filled the cabin, and he could hear a crackle that sounded very much like fire. He could taste blood. 
He tried to remember how to pick his head up and settled for rolling it sideways instead. Wrong way, that was the wall. He rolled his head the other way, trying to ignore the way his stomach rebelled. She was sitting, calmly. Her eyes were open, and her hands were wrapped around the restraints at her shoulders. She was so still that for a moment he thought she was dead, and he gave a croak, a desperate attempt to say he was sorry. He thought she would be better off in the shuttle. He jumped when she looked over at him. Her head had slammed against the wall at some point during the landing. Her forehead and cheek were beginning to bruise a deep red with mottled purple. There didn't seem to be much of anything in her eyes as she unhooked herself and came to check him. Her fingers poked at his ribs, tipped his chin up. His head slumped once, and she drew her hand back as if she'd been burned. She thought his neck was broken, he realized. He picked his head up and shook his head. He had the sense of forgetting something. All right, he slurred. I'm all right. Nothing was coming out the right way. Um, better. What couldn't he think of? She shook her head and fumbled at the clasps. He realized that he was listening for something. Other fighters. More of them. Fighters. To tell us, Dean. His voice was still slurred. She shook her head and caught him as he slumped forward. There was a wiry strength in her as she leveraged him out of the chair and half carried, half dragged him into the main cabin. Her arms gave out when she tried to lay him on the ground. He could feel the effort it took for him to lift him, but she didn't make a sound, not even a grunt. She might not have flown the shuttle before, but she had watched when he came into the shuttle, and now she jabbed at the buttons to open the door. When they didn't open, she thumped the control panel, her brow furrowed in frustration and Pike felt his lips crack as he smiled. It was nice to see she felt something, at least. Hitting the control panel, however, seemed to work. The doors creaked, hissed, and sprang open. Pike froze, but there was still no drone in the air, and the view outside was only rocks and scrub brush, no Telestines pointing guns at them. That was good. Pike wasn't sure he could stand up. He watched the girl peek out of the shuttle and look around and then she came back and stared at him in evident consternation. What she lacked in strength, she made up for in determination. She pulled on his wrists to haul him upright and braced him on her knees while she eased around the back of him, then heaved him over to the doorway with her hands under her armpits. This wasn't, Pike reflected, extraordinarily good for his pride. Rashenkov would laugh at him. Also, Rashenkov would laugh at him for crashing the shuttle, which was allowed to be funny now that they weren't dead. Having deposited him mostly upright, the girl crouched in the doorway and contemplated the sky. It was getting dark, he realized. Night, son, he managed. Cold. He summoned every ounce of determination and banished the last of the fuzziness from his brain. We should stay here until morning. She looked over at him. He could see her considering, and then she nodded. The suggestion seemed to meet with her approval. I'm sorry I crashed the shuttle. She shrugged. It was almost like she was saying, It happens, you know. Um, I'll get you someplace safe, Pike managed. The Rebellion has a camp north of here. I think. Lord knew the camp to the south of them was gone. Every member of that one had been on the airship when it crashed. He looked down at his hands, bruised from the impact. Do you think any of them survived on the ship? She looked away at that. His lips tightened. Right. I'll get you to the other camp soon. We'll make it. I promise. She looked back. Her black eyes were clear, assessing. She was waiting for him to remember something. He tried to think back to what he'd said to her. There wasn't much of it. The dawning? She nodded. It was on the ship. He didn't want to think about it, but he had to face facts. It's gone. She shook her head, frowning. There's another one? Her frown deepened at that. You know where it is? She sat back on her heels, eyeing him. So, she didn't want to tell him. That was all right. He'd just have to hope she'd tell someone else. Okay. Um, we'll get you to the base, all right? They'll be able to get in contact with the Admiral. For the first time, he felt a stab of something like hope. 
Maybe they could still find it. Maybe they could all still make it out of this alive. Don't give up, Walker. Chapter 21 Earth Mountains near Denver, North American Continent The night passed slowly. Searchlights swept across the mountainside, looking for survivors. Pike slept fitfully. Every once in a while, the light passed directly over the shuttle and lit the windshield a brilliant white. Light that spilled into the interior. He would wake and find his mind a bit clearer. The girl was always awake, sitting against the closed shuttle doors, her gaze fixed on the back wall. What's your name? he asked her once. She didn't answer. On another waking, soaked in sweat from a nightmare he couldn't remember. How did you end up in the labs? She didn't answer that either. Each time he woke, his mind was clearer. Sometime before dawn, he pushed himself up and leaned his head back against the wall of the shuttle. The imagined voices of the trapped rebellion soldiers were ringing in his head, a relentless reminder of the lives he'd left behind. What few words they'd spoken to him during the two weeks of their acquaintance were stamped in his memory now. He could hear Eva's warnings and Charlie's defiant assertions. They'd resented him and everything he stood for. A rebellion that wasn't even based on Earth, run by spacers, with terms dispatched like edicts to those on the ground. Their fears about him had been well-founded. He had to acknowledge that. He looked over and saw the girl watching him. Her eyes were sad. I left them to die, he told her. She didn't look away. Her head tipped up in a wordless question. The rest of my team, on the Telestine ship, there were ten of us. You heard me call for them, but they didn't answer. I left them there to die, he repeated almost defiantly. He expected an automatic protest. The words etiquette demanded. She would tell him that they had already been dead. Or she would tell him that he would only have gotten himself killed too if he'd gone after them. Those were familiar words by now. His fingers clenched. She didn't say anything. I don't even know why I'm here, Pike told her. I wanted to see home, but that seems stupid now. I lived without it all these years. Space wasn't as bad as my father said it would be. While his father sickened and died on Johnson Station, Pike had joined the half-feral gangs of children who played hide-and-retake Earth in the labyrinthine corridors, holding mock airship battles in the low-gravity rooms and debating the futures they could have. Traitor, cargo pilot, vacuum welder, exterior mechanic. Everyone wanted to be an exterior mechanic, clambering around on the outside of the station to fix solar panels and hull dents. His planned future? Farmer. The other kids laughed cruelly. She still hadn't said anything, and he felt obliged to fill the silence. It felt strange. He was normally the one who didn't talk. I was born on Earth, he explained. Not far from here, maybe a few miles north. We're close. I don't think the camp exists anymore. It got hit by the Telestines. He saw a question in her eyes. My father was working with the Rebellion. The day they came to get information from us, the Telestines came too. The Rebellion soldiers took as many of us as they could on the shuttle. My mother and sister, they didn't make it. She curled her knees up and wrapped her arms around them. Her black eyes were steady. I didn't want to be a part of the Rebellion after that. Pike admitted. It felt good to say it. In the past few weeks it had been manifestly clear how unwelcome that admission would be to his compatriots. It was a lie of omission, but still a lie, and it ate at him. The girl didn't recoil. She gave a minute nod instead, one that said she had heard him and she was considering things. It was enough. I still don't want to be, actually. Or I didn't. After today, things seemed more jumbled than before. It seemed like too big a risk. We have a life out there, and we don't really have enough ships for a rebellion. When Walker told me about the plan, I didn't even listen. I just wanted to come back and see the planet. To see mountains and trees again. And I felt like, I'm human, right? When the head of the rebellion says they need you, and you could save everyone's life, you can't say no, can you? I just didn't know that what we were trying to do wasn't even possible, that's all. His lips curled with irony. 
and it wasn't. We couldn't even get one piece of tech out of a lab. He glanced sideways to look at her. If it weren't for you, we wouldn't even know we could still get at it. Do you know what it looks like? The dawning? Were they developing it there? A pause, and she nodded. What is it? She shook her head. Finally, she shrugged. I'm hardly going to tell anyone, he pointed out. And it's not like I shouldn't know in any case. I did come here for it. She gave the ghost of a smile at that, but another Telestine plane shot overhead with a flash of light in the cockpit, and they both instinctively stilled. It was reassuring when she did things like that, Pike decided. It reminded him that she was human, which seemed an odd thing for him to keep forgetting. He tried to be fair about her reticence. She didn't know him from Adam, and he had shown up with a group of people who crashed the ship she was on and delivered her to a very dubious safety. He let his eyes drift closed. He was getting tired again. A missed Earth, he told her. It seemed like the most honest thing he'd said in years. I liked running cargo ships. I liked seeing Jupiter. Didn't like Mars. Venus was weird. Never been to Saturn or Neptune, but Jupiter. The sight of Jupiter, blocking out half of the black, always sucked the air right out of his lungs. I liked seeing Jupiter every time. It's basically humanity's home now. The stations and the snowballs. Callisto, Europa, Ganymede. Cargo was a good trade. Smuggling even more. Everyone needs things. We brought water from Europa sometimes. They hauled it up to the ship and crated it there. These huge blocks of ice on a chain. She was watching him, swaying slightly side to side. He could see her, trying to picture it. She seemed like she might smile at any moment. Maybe uh, I'm supposed to feel like we're going to die if we don't get Earth back, Pike admitted. I'm not sure I do. I never just believed that. My dad used to talk about NASA and America and McDonald's and aircraft carriers, and those were just words to me. I don't like them being here, though. I don't like them having our planet and just running us off, and... The truth seemed too deep to admit, but she was waiting for it silently, black eyes expectant. I don't think I can leave again, Pike admitted. And no, I can never come back. This was supposed to be my home. I was going to get Walker the Dawning, she'd do her fleet thing, and then after all the Telestines were dead, I'd come back. And then I'd farm. I'd farm. He didn't understand until that moment. All these years, he'd known the rebellion as rage. His father's twisted grief, a shell of the strident anger he'd carried with him on Earth. Walker's cold, calculating fury. The traitorous whispers he heard on every long pass between Jupiter and Mars. The eons of black there seemed to drag confessions out of anyone. His rebellion wasn't about anger. All those years he'd spent shoving the rebellion away, too weary to let that ceaseless rage eat him up with the rest of them. He'd forgotten the only thing that mattered. Earth. He wanted Earth back so badly he ached with it. The dawning, his voice trailed off in a croak. The dawning was supposed to help us get Earth back. Stupid computer chip. He eyed her carefully. It's not inside you, is it? She shook her head violently. Okay, then, he thought, standing up and offering her a hand. Come on, we've sat long enough. If we don't move, they'll find us. Chapter 22 one million kilometers sunward of L1 Lagrange Point, Earth. Deck 5 Hallway, EFS Intrepid. Commander King was waiting for him in the shadows of the hallway outside the landing bay. She waited, composed, as the medics came and examined his head, and made him count backward and say how many fingers they were holding up. They asked him what he remembered, and he said nothing, because he knew the truth would frighten her. The Intrepid? impossibly small against a darkening sky, too far away to reach, as the satellites came online nearby, and he thought he might as well have gone out in a blaze of glory with fisheye, or stuck around to help the pilot of the shuttle. How he'd gotten back to the ship, he didn't know, and he didn't care much either. All he remembered was the hollow feeling of following the command to return, wondering why it even mattered, 
when a life could get snuffed out that easily. Then the medics were gone, and it was just him on the floor, still in his flight suit, and her waiting, silently. She knelt at his side after a moment. She held the ship for you, she said finally. The Admiral? He opened his mouth to ask her why she was telling him that, and realized that she didn't know what to say right now either. He looked up at her familiar face with its faint dusting of freckles over the bridge of the nose, and reached out to pull her close. His arms were too tight around her, he knew, but she was squeezing him back just as hard. After a moment, her torso shook and he felt tears on his neck. I made it back, he said irrelevantly. Irrelevant because they both knew now that he was never going to make it. How could he possibly survive when the Telestines could take out fighters so readily? If he didn't die in the next mission, he'd die in the one after that. She pulled away and ducked her head as she wiped her cheeks. When she looked up, her face was absolutely composed. She took a moment before she spoke. I'll follow you. He didn't understand for a moment, and then it hit him in the gut. If he died in whatever battle she intended to go to. No. His head was moving of its own accord. Baby, no. Did you just call me baby? She gave something that might have been a laugh. He laughed too, sort of. It felt like that kind of moment. She reached out to press her fingers over his. I'm not afraid. You're not a fighter pilot either. He met her eyes. You'll be in command of a battleship. You think all of our ships are going to make it? She gave a rueful smile. There are going to be some who shield the flagship in the final battle, some who shield the dawn. She broke off. I'm not afraid, she said again. I am, he shook his head. I am. Ari, sweetie, don't do this. When I go, he broke off when she put her hand over her mouth. It's going to be okay. He tried to tell her in spite of the hand. He hadn't realized before today how sure it was that he'd die here, like this. But with that knowledge had come some measure of acceptance. You're gonna be okay, Harry. You're gonna find some nice guy and- Don't! She shook her head fiercely. If- Her voice trailed off and she looked over her shoulder. A single set of footsteps was approaching. They both knew who that was. The quick, measured footsteps were like a unique fingerprint. He squeezed her fingers. Go. I'll catch up with you later. His voice was low, and he watched as she hurried out of sight around a corner. When he looked back, the admiral was there. Her hands were clasped behind her back, the way she always stood. He wondered if she ever relaxed, and decided she probably didn't. Her eyes were cool on his. Is that going to be a problem? He went cold. How she'd guessed. How she'd known about him and King he didn't know, but it didn't matter. No, ma'am. Good. She seemed to take the words at face value, and she came to help him up from the floor. The medics tell me you have a minor concussion. You'll need to rest for about forty-eight hours, but after that you'll be good to go. Do we have forty-eight hours? He reached up to scratch at his head and winced when his fingers touched the bruise. She considered, and then lifted her shoulders. No way to know. Any word on the pilot of the shuttle? Her face went still, and he knew he'd made a mistake of some sort. No, she said simply. Ma'am, are we allowed to know what we were doing there? It was way out of line, but she nodded. You've more than earned that, I think. You have a right to know what you put your life on the line for. On that shuttle, she considered. No, in the lab, we'll start there. Was something called the donning. The word King had almost uttered. He waited for more. It might be the key to undermining the entire Telestine defense grid. We have reason to believe that it, or a crucial component of it, made it onto that shuttle. His jaw had dropped open. He had not doubted that there was a reason for him to be out there, but he would never have guessed that it would be something like this. That would put us close to- Yes, she cut him off with a nod. If we can retrieve it. Get me back out there. You injured, McAllister. Rest. I- He didn't want to rest. He didn't want to think. If he stayed in the hospital bed, he was going to be thinking of Fisheye. Fisheye, who had died without ever knowing any of this. He'd sacrificed blindly. She saw his face. It wasn't what I came. I came to say, 
I'm sorry about Hernandez. I know the two of you were close. There was a lump in his throat. He nodded jerkily. Thank you, ma'am. I want you to remember why he died, she spoke quietly. To save me. And he was never, ever going to be able to make up for that. No. Her eyes were like chips of stone. He died because the Telestines have enslaved us. He died for humanity. He could not look at her. He drew himself up, trying to use etiquette to keep from breaking down. We have no time for guilt, McAllister. Her voice seemed to come from far away. He nodded, silently. Avenge him. I will, he swallowed. Ma'am, I'll get Earth back for him. She hesitated, but only for a moment. When every fighter of theirs is out of the sky and every carrier is downed, he will be avenged. Remember that they did this to him. Chapter 23 Earth Mountains near Denver, North American Continent It took Pike most of the next morning to realize they were going in the wrong direction. Everything had started out well enough. At some point in the night, the patrols seemed to have ceased, and it was safe to be outside again. They watched the smoking wreck of the airship on the mountain below, while they ate an uncooked food cube from the shuttle's emergency bag. The girl gave him a look that said she was trusting him that this was safe to eat, and he'd better not be messing with her. She appeared manifestly unimpressed when he pointed out that, with the airship so close, everything was going to taste like smoke anyway. The Telestines hadn't, apparently, stopped to take care of anyone in the airship or even bother putting out the fire. Why would they? The thought was bitter. It wasn't their planet, after all. What did they care? They would only have bothered if it marred the perfect view from occupied Denver. He was limping, and she strapped the emergency pack to herself before they set off, holding out a hand to help him over a rock and onto a makeshift path. That, he realized later, was where he went wrong. She chose the path, and he followed. It wasn't like he didn't have clues, of course. He knew the demolished laboratory was to the south of them, and it took them a good hour to get past it. He didn't put the pieces together, however, until about an hour after they had stopped to take shelter from the sun. Without a chance to fill up the water skins, they couldn't risk direct midday exposure. Something the girl already seemed to know. She led them down the slope to a promising-looking partial cave, surrounded by withered trees and a dry creek bed. They didn't talk. She, apparently, couldn't talk, or so he was coming to believe, and he was too tired to do anything but watch the thin, scraggly shadows make their way across the ground. At one point, he craned his neck to see the distant bulk of the ship. He supposed he should tell the nearby rebellion cell about that thing, on the off chance they could salvage some of the tech. He'd heard about the interference problems, Surely they'd figure it out sometime soon. They tried to mark where it was in his head. Fifteen kilometers north? Eighteen, perhaps? They'd be able to see it anyway. It wasn't exactly small or hidden, and the smoke was kind of a dead giveaway. The girl had shoved herself up and wandered up the hill somewhat. He didn't look, trying to give her privacy, and was surprised when she came back with berries. She held them out with a smile. You can't eat those. He shook his head. They're poison. She looked at the berries, then back at him, surprised. She disappeared again in a little puff of dust, and was back a few minutes later, with what looked like a collection of every plant she could find. She spread them out, and pointed to them one by one as he searched his memory. Uh, that's edible. So's that, but there's nothing to it but to fill up your stomach, and only if you boil it. Not that one. He saw her mark the shape of the leaves carefully, and approved of that. She could learn. That one makes a tea you can use when your stomach is upset. That one's poison. That one's not poison, but you don't want to use it too much, and dogs can't eat it. She frowned at the mention of dogs. Four legs, furry. He shook his head at her wide-eyed expression. Not bears. Uh, dogs aren't big. Maybe half your size? Few places had them anymore, though. No way to breed hunting dogs in space, his father had said. And if a dog didn't hunt, it was just another mouth to feed. Probably had them on Venus, though. They have everything on Venus. Pike watched as she leaned forward to study the plants again. He wondered if she'd been marking the shape of the mountains as they came south. 
Probably. South. His head whipped around to look at the smoldering airship wreck, and he swore with all the inventiveness of a lifelong cargo hauler. When he looked back, the girl was watching him warily. We've been going south? She nodded. He felt his anger start to rise. She must have been waiting all morning for him to figure it out. You knew? You knew I wanted to go north? She nodded again. Her fingers played nervously with the leaves. You took me south, on purpose, knowing I wanted to go north. A nod. She didn't seem particularly sorry, which only made him angrier. Without discussing it at all. Yet another nod. I suppose you had your reasons. His tone was like acid, but she smiled when she nodded this time. She settled back against the rocks, seeming pleased that he'd figured it out. The smile, he thought, was entirely too smug. I hope they're good ones. He settled back in the shadows, cursing himself. Is there a closer rebellion base this way or something? She hesitated, and he wondered suddenly if she was taking him to the rebellion at all. During the break-in, he wasn't quite sure what to call it, there was a man guiding me through the labs. I don't suppose you'd know who that was? She frowned at him in a way that suggested he might be going crazy, and he had a memory of breaking down the door. Oh, he'd been alone, then. Of course she would think he was crazy. No, not with me, he gestured to his head. In my earpiece. He began to regret not taking more care of it after ripping it out of his ear. Rash. To lose tech just because it was malfunctioning. He knew better. She gave an eloquent shrug, as if to say that he should probably know his own co-workers. He wasn't part of the rebellion. He said he was only talking to me, and he knew a lot about me. He knew more about the layout of the labs than the rest of them there, and he asked me to bring the dawning to him instead of, instead of the admiral. This, at least, seemed to interest her. She sat up, eyes narrowed speculatively. Any ideas who that might have been? She pressed her lips together, deep in thought, and seemed to consider this. One hand motioned for him to keep talking. I really don't know anymore. He promised me he had humanity's best interests at heart, and that I wouldn't be harmed if I came to him. She tapped her own chest questioningly. I don't think he knows I took you. He was guiding me to the dawning, and when I got into the room and you were the only thing there, he was confused. I lost contact with him. She considered this. Can you tell me anything about what we're looking for? You don't think it's gone. Was it a program? She bit her lip, shook her head, but in a way that suggested he was close. So it wasn't one of those cube things. Another shake. I just tell me something, anything. You know about it, right? She hesitated. Again, she shook her head. Almost, the gesture seemed to say. But no still seemed to be more accurate than yes. And you don't know who the man is, either. More a statement than a question, and he wasn't surprised when she shook her head. I guess I'd figured... Pike shook his head. I have no idea how you would know who he was. I just thought maybe you might, since you didn't seem to think much of the rebellion. Silence. She didn't look at him. Although I suppose we share that. She looked over at him, expression unreadable under a sunburnt nose. As much as I hate to admit it, though. If you know where the dawning is, maybe it's best we do take you. Pike froze. The girl looked over at him questioningly. There's someone nearby. She shook her head and moved her hand to indicate either a mouse or a monstrously large spider. Pike shoved that unpleasant image out of his mind. No, it's... Stay here. Very carefully, he eased himself against the edge of the rock and peered out. Directly down the barrel of a shotgun. Chapter 24 Earth Mountains near Denver North American continent. Up, on your feet. There were five of them, all men wearing faded plaid shirts and patched jeans with leather boots, and they all had shotguns. Their faces were weathered, 
the sort of weathering you couldn't avoid in the mountains, and their fingers were rough from work. None of them looked the least bit friendly. They did, however, look unsettled by the girl. It was probably her eyes. She didn't seem worried in the slightest, staring at each of them in turn as if she were taking a tally of qualities, and moving on to the next with a faint nod. So who the hell are you? The one who'd hauled Pike up held his gun, easily, ready to point. We're with the Rebellion? He judged that to be safe enough. His men didn't look like drones who'd lived in captivity, and they didn't seem the sort to stare at the sky and dream of escaping off-planet, either. He figured they'd be sympathetic to the Rebellion. He was wrong. So you're the reason there's a crashed ship and fuggers swarming all over our ass. The men looked deeply unimpressed with this state of affairs. The girl nodded. Pike gave her a look that said she wasn't helping, and she shrugged. It's true, her eyes said. The man was looking between them, eyes flicking back and forth. Blake will want to talk to you, then. Who's Blake? None of your damn business. The man jerked his gun south along the range. Get walking. All right. Pike limped his way around the outcropping. But I'd like to point out that we didn't know anyone was here. Yeah, well... That's how you don't get your camp blown up by the Telestines, isn't it? It was hard to argue with that. Pike set off and the girl followed, slipping the straps of the emergency pack over her shoulders again. Now that she'd taken the time to assess each member of the group, she didn't seem particularly interested in any of them. So how'd you crash the ship? One of them finally asked about half an hour later. Pike was glad for the distraction. They had been walking in silence, with the occasional stumble and oath. The men had stopped pointing their guns at the captives, but they weren't tolerating a slow pace, and his leg was killing him. The girl looked over in interest, as if she'd been wondering the same thing. Not on purpose, Pike admitted grudgingly. We were shooting at the feathers, and one of them crashed into it. Feathers? There are planes, the ones with the metal that looks like- Ah, oh, yeah, those ones, the man nodded. Better than the black ones. What are the different kinds? It was not inspiring that this man seemed to know more than the Rebellion. Well, there's the ones you call feathers, not nice. They shoot things, but they generally don't care, unless you get real obvious like. They spend a lot of time shooting rocks and trees and shit. The man shrugged, as if to suggest that no one could understand the Telestines, and no one should try. They go with that type of ship, the pretty one, and you know you're having a quiet day. The other type of ship now, with the bays and the fighters and all, those ones are dead black, and they fly silent. I don't remember those. The man frowned at him, but didn't ask any of the questions he clearly had. They're new. Stop here. What? Why? Pike looked around himself at the barren slope. Your camp is here? You can't possibly be that good at camouflage. It's not here. The man jerked his head as the youngest member of the group, or least weathered at any rate, set off into the trees at the base of the hill. We're not going to show you where it is. We're not stupid. What do you think I'm going to do, call the Telestines on you? Given that that's the only thing we've ever seen you do? Yeah, the man sat on a nearby rock. It'll be a while. You might as well sit. Pike was only too happy to take that suggestion. <clears throat> I don't suppose you have any water. The man hesitated, but pulled out a water skin and handed it over. Make sure she gets some, too. He waited until Pike had leaned over to hand the skin to the girl, then beckoned him close. What's her deal? She don't talk? Maybe she doesn't have anything to say to you, Pike suggested. He handed the water skin back and smiled subtly. He was under no particular obligation to be polite, he figured. It was, indeed, a while until the runner came back. The man with him, Blake, they had said, was weathered, clean-shaven, with eyes as piercing a black as the girl's. His hair had gone entirely white, and the sun had weathered his skin to a deep brown. He stopped a few paces away and studied them. So, who the blazes are you? He said finally. It was odd, but Pike had relaxed for the first time in years. People on the stations didn't talk like this. Blunt speech seemed to be a thing for cargo haulers and earthers and even cargo haulers were circumspect about any number of things. Maybe the sun brought it out in people, he thought. We're the only survivors of that thing. He jerked his head at the distant wreck and warned himself not to get too comfortable. 
These people would just have killed him if they were seriously worried, but there was only so much he could say. Mad you and the labs? Blake's bright eyes sharpened. You got tracking chips or something? Pike's head whipped around to stare at the girl, horrified. She shook her head, and he raised an eyebrow. She shook her head again, more emphatically this time. Uh, apparently not. She's from the labs, then. What about you? I'm with the rebellion. Out of the corner of his eye, he caught the girl watching him. Her face was still, and her eyes were disappointed. He knew what she wanted him to say. All right, I'm not actually with the rebellion. The men's fingers tightened around their guns. I'm here because I knew someone there, and they thought I'd be a good fit for this, but I know the mountains. I was born north of here, but the camp was destroyed about twenty years ago now. Swore I wouldn't get involved in the rebellion, but he rubbed at the back of his neck. Here I am. Why? This man wasn't impressed by maybes. Pike looked up and met the girl's eyes again. Tell the truth. He could almost hear the words. I... don't know. I came back because I wanted to see Earth. Told myself I understood how things were. The rebellion wasn't strong enough to beat the Telestines. Told myself there was no point in trying to change it yet. Came here because they could get me home. See the mountains again. Trees. You know, air. The men nodded at that. But, Pike swallowed, we're looking for a weapon. He knew his voice had changed and he could see their wariness. It exists, I swear it does. It's called the Dawning and it can bring down their entire defense grid. I didn't think we could do it. It was supposed to be on that ship and she and I got out while it crashed, but she knows where it is and, well. Well, what? The man was still staring at him. Everyone was staring at him and it occurred to him now that perhaps one of the reasons he liked cargo hauling was that there generally wasn't anyone looking at him. No one to harangue him. He hunched his shoulders. Look, I don't know if this is going to work. Odds, it won't. What we've got, it's nothing compared to their tech. I know that. But she says she knows where this thing is, and if it works, we actually have a shot at taking Earth back. He tried to keep the words back, his father's words, but they pushed their way out anyway. We're all gonna die one way or another, right? They're gonna kill us. Some people die on the stations, some on the snowballs when vacuum seals break, and some people die here when they hit the camps. Maybe I'll take a few out on the way, and maybe I'll take them all. Probably not, but now that I'm back, I think I'd rather try than live out my days wondering. There was a long silence. Well, you didn't bullshit me. Blake was staring up at the sky. He looked back to Pike. So thanks for that, boy. Boy? Really? The man closed his eyes and sighed. You were born on Earth and you don't know to shut up when your elders are talking? Pike shut up. That's better. The man looked around himself again. Here's the deal. I don't like the rebellion. They start a lot of shit they can't finish, if you want my opinion. I gave a laugh. Hell, you're getting my opinion whether you want it or not, but I like you. His eyes narrowed. Maybe not. I like her, though. She doesn't lie. She doesn't talk, Pike pointed out. You do. And she got you to tell the truth, didn't she? Blake didn't wait for an answer. In any case, you didn't lie. Probably won't work. You'll probably die. But you're willing to put your life on the line, and the truth is, I'd like my grandkids to grow up without these fuckers around. So I'm going to help you out. Pike felt his eyebrows shoot up. Don't make a big deal out of it. It won't be much, the man advised him. Food, shelter. Oh, and I may, just may, have a stolen Telestine shuttle laying around. Fancy Telestine tech and everything. We can't use it. Never figured out how, so we stowed it for a rainy day. And I figure your girl there might be able to do something to it. Consider it yours. A shuttle? Pike couldn't keep the amazement out of his voice. Blake had the stoic look of a father on Christmas morning. Come on, let's get you some food before you head out. Chapter 25 One million kilometers sunward of L1 Lagrange Point, Earth. Outside the EFS Intrepid. Accelerate! 
Go, go, don't ease off, push it. Tox's voice echoed down the comm lines. Come on, newbie, you fly like my granny. He's doing pretty well. Maybe someone should get your grandma a fighter of her own. Princess sounded like he was grinning as he guided his craft in a smooth arc next to the newbie's shaky efforts. He and Tox were flanking, giving the newbie the experience of flying point in a formation. McAllister hung below, watching through the windshield as the makeshift formation came through. Tox and Princess deposited the newbie in a loose group of fighters and waved the next in. There was no substitute for experience. They had training programs, of course, a VR headset and a mock-up of the cockpits that got new recruits ready for the multitude of switches and thrusters and roll maneuvers. You couldn't get the G-forces in a simulation, though, and you couldn't recreate the feeling of being very, very small in an enormous universe. They weren't going to get experience with atmosphere this way, of course, but it was the best McAllister could do for them right now. The more familiar they were compensating for the G's and learning which button was where without looking, the better they'd be in the pulling royal of Earth's atmosphere. McAllister! He looked up and swore. The next newbie in line had been doing fine until he tried to pull up and went down instead. Now he was hurtling toward McAllister's fighter, wobbling as he tried to adjust. Old course, newbie! He gunned his engines, pulling to starboard to avoid. I've got it! The newbie called back. He tried to adjust and swerved right toward McAllister's escape vector. I said hold course! The yell came from deep in his chest. He yanked the controls up and shot out of the way by scant meters. He pulled the fighter around, cold with fury now. I want you dead in the water, newbie! What the hell did you think you were doing? Theo. Princess's voice was quiet. No. He's good enough to be in a plane, he can explain himself. So? Huh, newbie? The newbie held his fighter stable. His voice was barely audible. I was going to pull up, but the controls aren't quite like the simulation. You ran a training maneuver out here earlier, right? R right, I just... I didn't think... I'm sorry, sir. Sorry, McAllister said, his heartbeat pounding in his ears. He is not good enough. Sorry is gonna get your ass killed. You and your wingmates, you hear me, pilot? I, I just... Panicked when I brought the plane the wrong way, and you can't panic. You don't get to panic. Panic is a luxury we don't have out here. You want to panic? You stay on the colonies with the rest of the civilians because we don't need you here. You hear me? You panic and you're out. Done. There was a long silence. Get back to the ship. McAllister's voice was hoarse. Everyone, we're done for the day. No one protested that they hadn't all gotten to go yet. After McAllister's outburst, he knew no one particularly wanted to go anymore. The team launched into motion silently and he watched them go. Tox began to talk them into the approach, voice even. If she disapproved of what he'd done, he knew she'd never say it on an open channel. Princess, though, hung back. He watched with McAllister as the newbie slid into place at the back of the group. The wings were still wobbling a bit. How you doing? Of course. Princess on a private channel. Don't. He's not fisheye, dude. He was never gonna be fisheye. McAllister could feel himself shaking. I said, don't, Princess interrupted. You remember that bar out on Neptune, Horvath Station? McAllister looked over at that. The further out you got in the system, the worse the drinks got, and the more people drank. When the sun had dwindled to a vague spot of light in the black, and all you could see out a single window was unending darkness, the stations turned into an enclave for the half-alive. The people worked because there was nothing else to do. They hauled themselves through zero-G with gray, papery skin. They ate protein rations that had expired a long time ago. But man, could they drink. A fact the team had discovered on one of their longest-ranging patrols aboard the Pele back when she was still disguised as a cargo hauler. What about it? McAllister asked now. You remember that chick fish I was with? I think it was before you took your flight suit off. His voice took on a stoic edge. Also before you kissed me. I said I was sorry about that. Yeah, well, dude's gotta do what a dude's gotta do. 
McAllister tried to remember back through the blur of that night. A girl. Fish was all over. Brown hair, I thought it was talks for a bit. And so did I. I was pissed. Anyway, I haul him off her and go to punch him in the face. And the girl said to me, she says... McAllister started to laugh. He could remember it now. The smoke, the laughing. Princess going to beat the shit out of Fish Eye and talks trying to hit Princess over the back of the head with a chair to slow him down. Turned out that maneuver doesn't work so well in Zero G, with two pilots drunk off their asses. She says, Oh, hell no, that's my sugar. Princess descended into laughter after mimicking the woman's heavily accented voice. McAllister leaned back in his chair and laughed. He dimly heard Princess's voice continue. And then the next morning, we tried to fly a patrol and you landed your damn fighter on an asteroid and broke the wing off, crashing it, trying to get up again? There was a silence. McAllister's laughter faded and he looked over. What's your point? I'm saying, if it was fisheye sitting where you're sitting, and you'd scratch that maneuver back there, you know what he would have said? Because he had said it two years ago. Tiboludo, McAllister, let's hope the Telestines fly like you do. Come on, I'll buy you a coffee. McAllister rubbed at his forehead. Right. The kid's nervous, Princess said quietly. He started his acceleration toward the ship, and McAllister followed along. Just give him some time to get up to speed. Princess? Yeah. He doesn't have time to get up to speed. McAllister tightened his hands around the controls. He pulls that shit when we're in battle. His wingmates are gonna die. Yeah, well... Princess watched with a critical eye. Stuck his landing here, didn't he? Anyway, how long were you really planning on living? He had a point. Chapter 26 Earth Mountains near Denver, North American Continent You done yet? Pike pitched his voice to carry up the hill, between the thin trunks of the aspen to where the shuttle sat. They'd removed the tarps and dead branches covering it, hiding it from casual view and from searching Telestine eyes overhead. The girl had disappeared inside more than an hour ago, fiddling with the computers as he made one last repair to one of the thrusters, and they were nearing the launch window now. Every day he hoped to hear her call back to him, but every day he expected that a little bit less. He smiled when she stuck her head out of the shuttle and gave him a thumbs up, a gesture she'd learned from the inhabitants of the camp, along with an impish appreciation for foul language. She looked so pleased with herself that Pike stepped up into the shuttle to see her handiwork. He remembered her helpless confusion in the rebellion shuttle, but it was clear that she learned quickly. He couldn't for the life of him tell what she'd done, however. He gave an automatic smile and a silent prayer that whatever she'd done wasn't going to drop them out of the sky as he ran through a few of the pre-flight checks quickly. Everything seemed to be normal. Sit tight, I'll be right back. He jumped down and waved to Blake. The man was hauling supply packs through the woods toward them, and Pike hurried to help. You didn't have to do this on your own. Young man, will you kindly stop insinuating that I have one foot in the grave? Blake, Pike was beginning to suspect, was prickly out of habit. But the man had a tart humor that Pike hadn't found anywhere since he left Earth. He was going to miss this place. Don't look like that, son. Blake gave him a look. You'll be back. I will. Pike grinned as they reached the shuttle. Well, we're not exactly on all your fancy networks now, are we? Blake began unloading the packs, handing provisions up to the girl. So someone's gonna have to tell us when the Telestines are gone. And here I thought you'd notice when they stopped wandering up and down the mountains. Don't be a smart aleck. Sorry, sir. Pike gave a conspiratorial grin up at the girl, and was pleased to see her looking fondly at Blake. She, like Pike, seemed at ease here. Whatever she'd hoped to find when she came south, she'd been pleased enough to wind up here, and she'd approved of their plan to take the shuttle up to the Rebellion fleet. If it was still there. The odds were quite low, actually. Pike looked up at the twilight sky and felt uneasy, not for the first time today. Blake saw the look. Don't think about it, he advised. You're a country boy at heart. You know there's no point in worrying about things you can't change, eh? Then why am I worrying about it? 
because you've been up there so long that you don't pay attention to what you learn down here anymore. You got all caught up in their plans. They're not your kind of people. You can't argue with that, Pike considered as he loaded the last of the rations. Plain potatoes and dried strips of meat weren't much in the way of variety, and he was certain they didn't have the perfect balance of chemicals Pike was used to in his food, but he was looking forward to them all the same. He missed having food that could be different day to day. Since he'd been back, he'd had fiddleheads and snake meat, beef, eggs, it seemed some chickens had been saved after all, and apples from a tiny orchard at the base of the camp. They even had cider that slid across the tongue with a fizz. The girl had looked very surprised at that. He told himself that he was fixating on the food because he didn't want to go, and he knew it was true. He couldn't shake the feeling that as soon as he saw Earth dwindle away in the shuttle's windows, he would never see it again. All loaded up, Blake nodded at him. Best go now, boy. There's not much of a window. The next Telestine satellite array flies by in another thirty minutes. The inhabitants of the camp, careful as any human settlement, had mapped the comings and goings of the different patrols. Every once in a while there was a dark space, and they'd found one now. As far up as the eye could see, there shouldn't be anything in the sky for a few minutes. Once they got past that, well, Pike would just have to trust the old claim that the Telestine defensive systems only shot things coming in, not things going out. He'd also have to trust that the exile fleet was still there, that Laura hadn't abandoned him. One thing at a time. He took his helmet from the girl and strapped it onto the makeshift suit. Like the shuttle, the suits were old, but while metal could be fixed, there was no technology here to make the suits airtight again. He was only putting on the helmet to make Blake feel better. Thank you for everything, he clasped Blake's hand. Don't get sentimental on me now, boy. Blake bobbed his head and stepped back. But thank you for giving an old man hope. He looked back to the camp where his grandchildren were playing, oblivious to the grown-up drama playing out here. Give those fuggers hell, huh? I'll do my best, sir. Pike ducked into the shuttle and stood aside for the girl to wave as the shuttle door closed. He sighed when he flopped into the seat. Well, let's get this show on the road. The sooner we get going, the sooner we can die when this piece of shit blows up. She laughed silently, shook her head at him. He knew she could hear the words he hadn't said. Well, I'm glad you have a good feeling about this. She settled back in her seat, cross-legged, the very picture of contentment. She reached out for the dashboard, which lit up at her touch, and she pressed a few buttons only she could see. The lights flickered. She scowled, then thumped the console firmly with her fist. The lights steadied. She turned and grinned broadly at him. We're not going to die, are we? She shook her head, cheerfully. Another touch and a control stick extended out of the console in front of Pike. He shrugged, and after she ignited the engines, he grabbed a hold of the controls. As he guided the shuttle up out of the trees and out of the sight lines, she took her helmet off. The sunburn on her nose was peeling, but she didn't look troubled, even when she craned to look up at the sky. Pike guided them as close to straight up as he dared. The air buffeted around the shuttle as currents pooled and shifted, but soon the shutters became smaller. The air was growing thinner, and soon it began to darken around them. His ears popped. One of the jarringly human aspects of leaving Atmo, and the shuttle's life support not compensating quickly enough for the inevitable micro-leaks in the hull seams. They were close to the border of the atmosphere when the alarm system blazed to life, beeping frantically. His head whipped around, searching for the source of the sound. No, they were in a dark spot. But he could hear the drone starting, and here he couldn't exactly get out of the shuttle and beat the Telestines to death with his bare hands. No. The girl reached out to lay her hand over his. She gave a little half-smile. It's not going to be okay, Pike retorted. He reached for the controls. Her grip was always stronger than he remembered. She dragged his hands away with a look and jabbed her finger at his chair. But if they see us, he began. The finger jabbed again. The Telestine ships shot overhead with an imagined burst of sound, black shapes that blotted out the stars they could see flickering above them. Their wings curved wickedly. The beauty of the ships seemed like an insult right now. The wedge passed narrowly overhead, three ships, five, 
Eight. They didn't change course, didn't even swerve. Their pace stayed constant as they shot away crossways, disappearing into the last wavers of the atmosphere. And Pike tried to remember how to move. He couldn't breathe. He was still picturing their ship shot out of the air and tumbling, with the wedge accelerating behind to blow them to pieces. In fact, was this a dream? Was he dying right now and his mind was just making up the idea that he was still alive and ascending? How would he know? He looked over to see the girl peering after the Telestines. Was that something you did? She nodded. You worked that into the computers? Another nod, this time with a shrug. Close enough, her expression said. Can you teach the fleet to do that? This time she shook her head emphatically. No. He had the sense that Walker was not going to take that for an answer, but they'd deal with that problem when they got to it. He reached up to begin the scan and paused. Think it's safe to look for the fleet? She nodded. All right, then. He sent out the first ping and settled back in his chair. The time limit came, and he sent the second ping. They were still ascending, and he peered around as best he could. He couldn't see any satellites. Then again, the thing about being on a planet was that you forgot just how big planets were, and how much larger a reach technology had. The satellites might be so far away that he couldn't see them, but that didn't mean they couldn't see him. He pressed his lips together as he sent the third ping. They wouldn't have left entirely, would they? Abandoned the mission, gone back to Jupiter? But the thin hope that had held him together was fraying. How could the fleet stay here? Where would they hide? And why would they if they thought the mission had been a failure? His eyes drifted closed. What in the seven hells were they going to do now? The shuttle apparently had thoughts on the matter. It shuddered, banked, and a course popped up on the screen. Pike stabbed at the course correction before shooting the girl a look. Want to tell me where we're going? She shook her head, eyes worried. It hadn't been her. She didn't know where they were going. That wasn't reassuring. And then the radios came on. Hello, Mr. Pike. The voice was amused. I'm glad to see you alive and well. Who is this? Did I not make an impression the last time we spoke? The voice was a bored drawl with all the elegant tones of the rich. Pike froze. Couldn't be. And yet he remembered it very well now, that affected voice guiding him through the labs. You hijacked my shuttle? Not at all. You still have complete control. However, I've taken the liberty of inputting the directions to a rendezvous point. The exile fleet is there? I... There was regret there. I don't know what to tell you, Mr. Pike. I'm afraid some of the exile fleet may have been lost in an attack on Jupiter. The rest seem to have fled. I'm still trying to determine where the survivors may be. We can ensure that you will be safe, however. I will see you soon. Chapter 27 One Million Kilometers Sunward of L1 Lagrange Point Earth Bridge EFS Intrepid we're going to have to be careful with this. Delaney was chewing his lip as he stared down at the plans. I don't think it's wise. Wise, Walker pointed out. Would it be not joining the rebellion? Wise would also cover not dropping Pike on Earth, not attacking the laboratory for the dawning, and not preparing to go back in any capacity until their fleet at Mercury was done. Walker knew what she was supposed to be doing. Abandoning the plan that had so clearly failed and going back to the plan she'd spent years crafting. They'd have a fleet, with a fighting chance, soon. They should use that, and go back to Earth with guns blazing. Instead, they found themselves hovering in the nearest dark zone, hoping that no passing Telestine patrol would see them, and hoping against hope that some signal would come from Pike. And they were making a new plan. Take out the hubs of Telestine activity, hit them in their very centralized city centers, Telestines didn't seem to have the urge to roam, to live alone. It was convenient. If the rest of the rebellion was willing to sacrifice Earth cities, that was, and they were being far too stubborn about it. There's a middle ground, Delaney began. This is what we're doing. Walker did not look up. 
She had no time to indulge her officers' worries these days. If they didn't like the way things were headed, they could leave. There was a long pause. I'd like to speak to the Admiral alone, Delaney said finally. The rest of the officers filed out of the room. Delaney didn't outrank all of them, but as one of Walker's first recruits, and as the oldest by far, he had de facto seniority. When they were gone, he strode to the door and locked it for good measure before turning to stare at her. She still did not look up. This had been coming for days, and she had waited with weary acceptance. There was no adrenaline in her, no fire. Her fingers found the chain under her uniform and pulled it out. Holding the cross in her hand offered her no comfort, and yet she could not seem to stop doing it. Pike! Her heart squeezed, and she looked up at last to meet Delaney's eyes. What the hell is going on with you? He asked her bluntly. At least she didn't have to sit through a pep talk. That was a relief. What do you think? Once she would have spat the words at him. Once she would have cared. I think we launched our first mission without much chance of success. It failed, and it knocked everything out of you. The words were brutal. He stalked back to the table. Now you're planning something that, frankly, should get you holed up for mass murder. I told you I thought it was unwise so the others wouldn't think I was challenging you. That was more than you deserved. I'm not going to stand by and watch while you nuke our cities, and frankly, I think if one failure is all it's going to take for you to get here, you can get out of the way and let someone else lead this thing. That got her back up at last. The rebellion is mine. Then lead it. Because you're not, and God knows humanity deserves better. You remember everything you threw in Asa's face when you took the rebellion from him? People dying in the halls of the station, remember that now. So a team died. Ships were lost. We knew that was coming. Not a person came here who didn't see their deaths on the way. Did you think we are going to make it through the final battle? Of course not. Though she was fairly certain she was envisioning a different final battle than he was. So, what is it? He braced himself against the desk, arms crossed. Because from where I'm standing, we never had a good shot at this. From the beginning. And you didn't think to say something? As I recall, you knew. You knew when you got into this that it was a long shot we'd ever take Earth back. Frankly, we got further than I expected. I thought we'd be dust by now. I thought we'd be dead in orbit around Jupiter. When that attack came at New Beginnings, he looked away. What? We don't have all day. She looked down at the map of the Telestine cities. We've got cities to nuke. I need to show humanity that Earth... His voice dragged her back to reality. That was the first time I thought we had a goddamn chance. That stopped her. What? Landing the dropship. It took something out of you. You hadn't watched your teams die before. I wondered if you had it in you to lead. And then when the attack on New Beginnings came, you turned around and you made the best choice you had. You sent your friends to die because you needed to, because the rebellion needed to survive. And that's when I realized we still had a shot at winning against those bastards, when I realized we had an honest-to-God leader on our hands. Walker looked down at the desk. They'd had a funeral ceremony for the crews of the Washington and the Pele. She'd spoken over the radio while the rest of the fleet hung in shocked silence. The stakes hadn't been real before. They wondered which of them might get sacrificed next, and she got the sense everyone had been a bit relieved when she'd led the intrepid into Earth's orbit. King hadn't said a word about it, and neither had Delaney. It had never occurred to her that he was proud of what she'd done. Was the dawning the only thing keeping you going, then? Delaney couldn't hide his contempt now. Five weeks ago, we didn't know it existed. We were outmatched then, too, but you weren't making plans like this. He stabbed a finger at the desk. You have no idea. What do you want me to say? Walker shook her head at him. I want you to explain why you're taking the chance of nuking the cities we're supposed to live in when we go back to Earth. I'm going to kill the Telestines. That was all she was prepared to say. Do you have a better plan to do that? Biological weapons, he said promptly. EMP, something to take down the computer systems. We don't have biological weapons, nor the capabilities to research and develop them. Lucky for us, little boy-style uranium nukes are a cinch. 
We can hit them with a small EMP at least. But we just don't have the time to be sitting around, researching biological and wasting precious— He waved his arms wide. Then we wait, until we do have them. So a few million more die while we wait. Millions have already died. They've already lost their shot at Earth. We aren't trying to help anyone who's alive right now. We're playing the long game for all of humanity. Do you even understand that? Better than you. She met his eyes and knew her gaze was cold. Believe me, I do. Then why the hell are you risking an attack now? You think you'll get them to pick up and leave? No. She dropped her head into her hands. I want to kill enough of them that we can take their defenses out. Misjudge that, and you put them right in humanity's position, he warned her. You don't want them to have nothing to lose. That's where we are. That's what makes us dangerous. It's supposed to be our edge. Leaving enough of us alive to fight and to hold grudges. That was their mistake. Let's not make it ours, too. Her fingers clenched the desk. For so many years they had accepted her reasoning. They had gone along with her plans as they needed to. She saw the patterns no one else did. She saw the picture no one else was willing to see. And now, at the very end, they were fighting her on it. She had to be calm. She had to convince them. Every generation we wait, we get farther from our memory of what we need to know, she said quietly. You still remember aircraft carriers. You remember NASA and, and frozen yoga and chewing gum. How many do? How many remember what we had the promise to be before this? We're living on scraps. If we wait now, we will be crushed. The rebellion will be gone. And how long will it be until someone revives it? A hundred years? A thousand? We'll be lucky if we survive another two generations out there on the stations and the snowballs. We will always fight, he assured her. His face had softened, though. Walker, I promise you, that is what humanity is. Humanity is dying, she told him simply. There may not be enough of us. Deep down, you know what this is. This is them killing us without killing us. This was them stripping everything away so that as we died, we couldn't mount a defense. We need to move now. Our humanity still remembers enough of what it was to grasp at the future that will save us. He wavered, and before he had a chance to formulate a retort, there was a pounding at the door. They exchanged a heavy glance, and Walker went to open it. Yes, there's a... there's a... The communications officer had clearly run all the way from the bridge. There's a shuttle leaving Earth, he managed at last. Just got a type beam message from one of our cells in the Rockies. They report that Pike left a day ago. A day ago. Relief almost made Walker's knees buckle. Pike. For five days she had told herself he was dead. Now she had proof he was alive. Or rather was alive a day ago. She hadn't planned on it. She had convinced herself he was dead. It was the only way she could go on, and not knowing made a pit open beneath her feet. He was dead, she told herself with one part of her brain, while with the other she told herself that she'd given him the best chance there was to survive. If he was dead, he wasn't alone on the surface. If he was dead, he wasn't in danger. They had seen the coming and going of a dozen Telestine patrol groups from their vantage point of their hiding place a million kilometers sunward of Earth, washed out by the glare of the sun, and every day the last rays of hope had faded from her mind. But now, now he was alive, alive and with something their source swore could lead them to the dawning. How it had been saved she did not know. She did not even know what it was. It was a chance. She had, on the desk before her, a bloody plan to put her final end game in motion. The end game she'd confided to no one. But with the dawning, she had a chance to do the same and spare the bulk of her forces in the process. Damn it. There was only ever the best choice. Deploy the fighters and tell all ships to spin up. We're we'll making a hard burn for Earth. Exactly how long ago did the shuttle leave? Twenty-three hours? The communications officer was getting his breath back. He slumped against the wall. 
It's out of the range of our sensors now, but it was just a shuttle. It didn't have the range to get anywhere. Any shuttle should have at least that much air. He'll have taken cover somewhere, behind an asteroid or next to a satellite or something. He'll know staying there is the best way for us to find him. Let's go. Is this safe? Delaney's voice was quiet. You have two options. She straightened her top. For the first time in days, she felt like herself. That shuttle may have the dawning on it. It's either this or the nukes and total war, which, at this point in the construction of the Mercury shipyards, I'm not confident we will win. But as long as the dawning could be ours, I'm putting my bets on that. He met her eyes for one moment before his jaw clenched tight. He nodded once. Good. Her voice was crisp. She held out a hand to haul the communications officer upright. Come along. We have a weapon to find. Chapter 28 Near Venus, Shuttle From the rendezvous point, it took two days to get where they were going, wherever that was. With each hour that passed, Pike revised his estimate on the location of their destination. First it was more likely an asteroid, then Venus, then Mercury, or Earth again for all he knew. He would have had a better idea if the rendezvous itself hadn't been so strange. The ship that met them was not only unnamed, flying without transponders, it didn't appear on their scanners at all until they were almost on top of it. It was a ghost, and Pike, who thought he had seen every invention humanity could dream up, and the horrified thought that this was a Telestine ship. It didn't seem to be when they got inside. The furniture was scaled for humans, not Telestines, and every inch of it was gorgeous. Light came from glowing glass orbs, the floors were polished, and there were carpets. Carpets on a spaceship. He'd never seen anything so ridiculous. There were full-sized beds in each of the rooms, made up with silk sheets, and a full spread of food had been set out. Hell, the artificial gravity felt like a full G, not the tenth G most pieced-together human ships had. Telestine artificial gravity tech was a wonder, but terribly energy-intensive. He wondered if there was bacon, too, as long as they were dealing with luxuries here. The luxuries didn't quite make up for the fact that they were clearly trapped, however. Pike spent the better part of two days pacing around the ship, looking for a way onto the bridge. There was none that he could find, and no one else seemed to be there, but the voice on the comm assured them that all was well, and that in fact he might have found details about the location of the exile fleet. In the meantime, they should enjoy the journey. There were books, movies, music. It made him nervous as hell, though the girl didn't seem to mind. As Pike made his rounds through the common room, she sat with an ever-growing pile of books. Sometimes she seemed to be looking for something specific, and he would find her poring over books on medicine, history, weaponry. Other times she'd be curled up with a novel, looking up occasionally to watch him. Meanwhile, the more Pike thought, the more he was sure he'd made a terrible mistake trusting this person. When at last the ship docked, his whole stomach turned over, and he tried to decide whether or not to hold his gun as the doors of the shuttle bay opened up. In the end, he settled for resting his hand on the grip. They knew he was a rebellion soldier, after all. It'll be okay, he said to the girl in an undertone. From the look she gave him, she didn't believe him at all. Well, neither did he and then the doors opened and his grip on the gun tightened by reflex. A lone figure stood waiting for them. The man's long black hair held a faint curl and was drawn back in a low ponytail down his back. His vest was white, as were his loose pants. He was very clearly unarmed, though Pike knew that being unarmed didn't necessarily mean the man wasn't dangerous. Indeed, this place probably had enough automated security to vaporize them on the spot. He glanced past the man to the windows beyond. They were on one of the floating estates of Venus. The figure bowed low. Mr. Pike, welcome. I am Paris. If you would accompany me. He came up with a faint smile, one arm gesturing to the end of the docking bay. Come on. Pike jerked his head. The girl gave him a look. I don't like it either. He gave a shrug. But they've definitely got the upper hand. Mr. Pike? The servant's voice was calm. 
This way, please. All will be explained. It took effort not to roll his eyes at the inlaid floors as he followed the servant out of the docking bay. Venus was meant to be the height of luxury, but surely no one needed marble on the lower decks. Doors slid open for them automatically as they walked. The docking bay gave way to a hallway of deep blue, video screens giving the illusion they traveled through the polyglass tubes in the oceans of Europa. None of the denizens of Venus would actually go to such a dangerous place, of course, but the view was extraordinary. They must be in one of the cities, not a lone estate. He could hear the crush of humanity vibrating through the metal. Stations were never quiet, even on Venus. It was part of why he'd become a cargo hauler, desperate to escape the pressure and the smell of so many bodies in such a small space. They'd never known anything else. He'd known Earth, though. Mountains, trees. He immediately banished the painful nostalgia. He'd abandoned his home, again, and thinking about it made it worse. An elevator, decorated with a truly obscene amount of gold filigree, awaited them at the end of the hallway. It will only be a short journey, Paris assured them. He swiped his hand over the terminal and stood back as the doors closed. Pike waited, gritting his teeth at the music. It didn't matter whether one was in the mines or the most luxurious place in the solar system, apparently. Elevator music was just universally terrible. The doors opened onto a flood of intense golden light. The girl winced. Mr. Pike, the familiar voice greeted them warmly. Pike squinted into the light, trying to make out anything beyond the blaze. The figure resolved as they were ushered out of the elevator. A man, with short black hair and the light suit favored by the inhabitants of the Venusian estates. Atmosphere could be corrected, but it was always warm here. Sweat was already sliding down Pike's back. It's good to meet you at last, the man smiled. I am Neon. Pike said nothing. He could think of nothing to say. The man was greeting him with the warmth of a host, but they had never met, and Pike didn't have the thing this man so desperately wanted. Why were they here? You will have questions, I think. Neon stepped back and gestured to a table laden with food. Please, eat. Ask. I will answer what I can. He cocked his head to one side. And who is this? The girl gave him a wordless look before going to the table, almost ostentatiously turning her back. If she had been a soldier, Pike would have known what to make of the gesture. Utter contempt for her opponent's abilities. As it was, he was left to wonder. Neon had only smiled at her silence. He looked back to Pike. You will surely want for some food as well, yes? He strolled toward the table at Pike's side. Tell me, what questions do you have? What the hell is your game? Uh, you said you might have picked up the trail of the fleet. Does the Rebellion know I'm alive? No. The answer was quick. Neon's face carried a trace of regret. Soon, I promise. You see, I have some questions to ask of you too, Mr. Pike. Neon paused and picked up a strawberry from the table. Good God. A strawberry. He popped it into his mouth and smiled. Questions? And a favor? Chapter 29 Venus, 49 kilometers above surface. Tong Estate, New Zurich. A favor, Pike stared at the man, incredulous. Yes, Neon met his eyes. You're joking, Pike said flatly. You brought me here, on a ship, worth more than some stations to ask for a favor? Yes, I'm listening. Pike heard the bitterness grow in his voice. And please don't call it a favor. Neon considered this with a small frown. He seemed surprised by Pike's frustration. But then rich people always were. Rich people thought money fixed everything. What would you call it? You brought us here without any real recourse. You might be pretending we're friends, but we don't know each other. And she and I have nowhere else to go. It's not a favor. It's an order. Neon looked surprised at that, and Pike wasn't sure if he wanted to laugh or cry. Rich people were crazy, or woefully naive. His host considered for a long moment before raising his voice to call the servant back from the door. 
I'd like to speak to Mr. Pike alone, please. If you'd escort our other guest to her rooms? No, Pike said flatly. Mr. Pike, she will not be harmed. Miss, you are quite safe, I assure you. I must speak to Mr. Pike alone. But I will see you later, at dinner. You don't have to go, Pike told her. She considered this, examining Neon with sharp eyes, and Pike was pleased to see that the man looked uncomfortable under her assessment. Whatever she saw, it was enough. She shrugged and turned on her heel to leave with the servant. As the door closed, Neon let out his breath slowly. That's the girl you found in the lab. She doesn't look lab-grown. She isn't. Mr. Pike, just Pike. Ah, yes. Neon paused, and when he spoke again, his voice was flat. He sounded uncertain and a bit frustrated. Here is the whole of it. I've been tracking the dawning since before I knew what exactly it did. All I knew at first was that it was important, very important. There isn't any foolproof way to intercept Telestine communications, however, and the ones pertaining to the labs operate on an entirely different system than the standard military communications. To be frank with you, it's not even clear if the two systems are allied with one another. How can research and development not be on good terms with the military? What we don't know about Telestine society is, quite frankly, almost everything. Neon met his eyes. At this juncture, it makes sense to question every assumption we have about them. I don't know, in fact, if the dawning was developed by the military, or if it was developed as a check on the military. Pike considered this. Why is it called the dawning? Because that's what I named it. Pike did a double take. You didn't think the Telestines would give it a human name, did you? Neon's eyes twinkled for a fraction of a second. Its real name is a Telestine word, of course. Dawning is... well, it's the closest translation I can make. Pike shrugged and repeated. So why is it called the dawning? A pause. I don't know, and that worries me. Pike considered this as he went to the table. There was some kind of bird there, roasted. A ridiculous extravagance when most meat could be lab-grown. He tried to figure out how to eat it and wondered why he would want to if it was filled with bones. He vaguely remembered a few roasted birds on Earth long ago. But even then it was a scarce luxury. For Christmas. Once every three years. The reason I asked to speak with you alone is the same reason I scanned your shuttle on the ship. And the reason I overrode your guidance systems. Neon glanced at the far door and looked back to meet Pike's eyes. The girl you have with you has, to the best of my knowledge, been in those labs for many years. And she has always moved with the dawning. Pike considered this. So? So, she has something to do with an experimental Telestine system, and I don't even know who built it. Why she's involved is a complete mystery to me. She may be its operator, which begs the question of why. What capabilities do humans have that Telestines don't? If Telestines are capable of working it, then why aren't they doing so? Most importantly of all, what does she think about it? If she knows what it is... She might well be working for the Rebellion, Pike said at once. She could have earned their trust and Mr. Neon broke off and breathed. That is a pleasant dream. But let us look at the facts, please. The Rebellion is small. How many have found their way into its ranks? A few thousand? Ten thousand at most? And that's people raised by humans, told by human parents and human friends that humanity is enslaved. People who see that every day. What's your point? Pike's voice was harsh. My point is that as far as I can tell, she may have been raised by the Telestines. Do you really want to place the hopes and dreams of humanity on her allegiance? Pike went hot and then cold. She's had plenty of chances to turn me in. She could have hurt me. She could have taken out a whole camp, the ones who got us that shuttle. There was pity in the other man's face. With all respect, you're not the biggest prize she could take down. The rebellion itself would make a better target, don't you think? Pike swallowed. It's one of the reasons I had you brought here, rather than letting you go to them. This isn't even my estate, and it's still a risk. Neon's eyes caught the flash in Pike's face. What is it? We passed Telestine fighters on the way out of Atmo, and they didn't stop us. The words were bitter. They didn't stop us. 
I should have known. I thought she cloaked us somehow, but he turned away. What type of fighters? Out of curiosity. The black ones with the curved wings. Interesting. Neon looked down at the floor. I think you understand my caution now. Why I wanted to speak to you alone. I wanted to know what, if anything, she'd done to the shuttle. So she's a Telestine spy? She might be. For all we know, there is some loyalty in her. For all we know, she's lived a life of pain, and she hates the Telestines as much as we do. The question is how much loyalty she has, and how far it will hold. Pike looked out at the clouds. So now what? We question her. She doesn't talk. She doesn't want to talk, but she can be persuaded. The words were said delicately, but the implication was clear. Neon was not yet willing to trust a woman found in Telestine Labs. No, Pike felt horror seize him. If you ever want her to be loyal, we don't have much time, Neon said quietly. The fleet was there to help you at Earth because their location near Jupiter was compromised. They've already lost two carriers and many of their fighters, and they are on the run. If we don't get the defensive grid down soon, we won't have a fleet to capitalize on that. Give me a better option, and I will use it. His eyes seemed sad, but his jaw was set. Pike searched for an answer, but came up blank, and his last sentence reminded him of Laura. There is only ever the best choice. Neon nodded as if in agreement. But we may not have a better option. The exile fleet is already coming up on Earth. Walker's going back to Earth? Pike's spine stiffened. Why? Either to pick you up, they probably detected your shuttle leave, or... A shadow passed over his face. Or? Or she's beginning her assault on Earth. Prematurely. Pike shook his head. No, she wouldn't do that. A raised eyebrow. Wouldn't she? You know her best, after all. He forced his back to relax, but couldn't dispel the ache in his stomach. How long do you think they can hold out? Chapter 30 Earth Low Orbit Bridge EFS Intrepid The fleet decelerated hard, right to the edge of Earth's exosphere. Only the Oxana held back, her fighters out, bays open on the off chance that Pike's shuttle was just hiding behind an orbiting asteroid or defunct human satellite, as the rest of the fleet made a diversion in the fore. Walker marked the progress of the fleet against that lone, tiny dot. Come on, Pike. The intrepid lurched as the engines roared to life, and Walker gripped the desk as the room rocked. The ship dropped altitude, and she let out a sigh of relief when they came to a relative stop a moment later as the engines pushed them into orbit at the upper reaches of the atmosphere. On the other side of the desk, Delaney looked like he might be sick. Telestine made inertial dampeners helped with acceleration. Or they tried to. But for some reason, the stolen Telestine tech struggled to make deceleration comfortable. It felt like none of them had been able to take a full breath since Walker gave the order. And she couldn't stop to let them enjoy the moment, either. Larson, give me news. Right. Larson's fingers danced over the screens and his lips twitched. Looks like we managed to get in under the radar. And? Are you ready for some good news? I think we took out a Telestine satellite on the way in without puncturing the hull, he added. I was going to say. Walker allowed herself a small smile. She kind of wished she'd saved this maneuver for the final battle against the Telestines. But it was impossible to deny how satisfying it was to screech into the atmosphere of her home planet at full burn and take out a few Telestines on the way. Are they regrouping? Their units are full of chatter, that's for sure. Broadening the sensor sweep. Larson waited, jiggling his foot with impatience. Around the bridge, the rest of the crew was also adjusting to the lack of extra Gs, with excess energy made manifest in pen-tapping, nervous smiles, and a great many people stretching hugely. All of the nervous activity stopped when the klaxons came on. We're detecting five fighter detachments, ma'am. Larson met her eyes. And it looks like we might have a carrier coming as well. All right. Walker laced her fingers behind her back and gave a silent prayer. Let's take out those detachments before the carrier arrives and make a lot of fuss while the Oxana finds our payload. Fight us out and dive. It was time to see if McAllister 